Welcome to the Pow Wow with Myra, where each week we bring you an inspiring person and their stories to help us discover different ways to see life and its challenges. My focus sits on being thoughtful, engaging, and entertaining. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for watching. All right. Well, welcome to the Pow Wow, Glenn. Thank you for having me. Thank you for, for being here again. Um, I want to start by learning a little bit about you. You are such a philosophical guy, and I enjoy every time we had conversations um, when we worked at our previous job together. Uh, but I don't know much about Glenn, about who, how, where he grew up, where does he come from, how did you grow up? Well, I, I was born in Minnesota. We moved around the country here and there. And then uh, I ended up graduating high school in New Mexico. And events happened, but uh, I ended up, my first paying job, if you want to call it that, other than a paper route, was a dishwasher at a hotel 20, roughly 20 hours a week at $3 and whatever it was. Uh, and that's the best I could do. It's a small town, not a lot of jobs, mm. no industry, no opportunity. Mm. So then I had the opportunity to move to Fort Worth. I knew somebody, uh, some people here. So I was, I was, it was rough. Mm. I had a rough young adulthood. So I had this little 200cc motorcycle and my little bag on the back, and I drove 600 miles roughly on that little bike, and I arrived in Fort Worth with $30. That's what I had. Okay. And then, and, and, and it's just a story, so you ask. Of course. My friend and his wife took pictures of me, and I didn't realize how rough I, it had been, but I was malnourished because I was eating once a week, twice a week. And all I usually had was a little bread and a little glass of milk. Because, you know, you're not going to go far on 60 bucks, mm. which is what I was making at the time. So when I came here, I got a job as a security guard and all of a sudden 40 hours. And I didn't know what to do. I was like, wow, I've made it now. I've really, <laughs> I've really arrived, right? Um, and so I did that, what's called contract security. I did that for a number of years and I ended up getting a job for Tandy Corporation. Um, you know, their headquarters downtown Fort Worth mm. and I was only there a couple of weeks and they laid everybody off. But in my application, I put I you know, a touch type, which I did. So they came to me and they said, well, you, know, you say you can type, right? Well, we'll give you a type test. And if you can pass that, you might have the opportunity to work for Tandy's alarm company, the in-house alarm company. Mm. Well, cool. So I went downtown, took the test, passed it. They immediately took me over to the alarm monitoring center. And I was sitting in the manager's office. He's interviewing me, and I'm looking out at this monitoring center, and it was space trekky, you know, <laughs> like futuristic trek. <laughs> I couldn't. I'm looking through the glass, and I'm going, "Hey, man, this looks, you know." And I knew that this was an opportunity. Mm. So the guy offered me the job. I'm thankful to him to this day. <clears throat> so I worked for uh, what was called Tandy Security Systems. About three and a half years. And, man, I walked in there, and I, and I was overwhelmed with what I saw. What I, I couldn't, like, deal with what I was dealing with. But I stuck with it. And mm. promotion to team lead, a little later, later, promotion to shift supervisor. And then eventually I became an assistant manager over tech, uh, tech, tech, technical support, mm. second shift monitoring, and... But I cut my teeth in that industry in that company. Okay. So that built my foundation. Mm. And I since have worked for uh, well, six alarm companies uh, over roughly 20 years. 
to this day? Not anymore. Not anymore. Okay. No, okay. I changed industries. Okay. But that was my, my background. Mm. And I was really proud of that career. Did I, anything that could be done in the central station, I did, including, pro, I mean, I actually programmed panels and worked with technicians that did install tests and all that. I really, really enjoyed that career. Wow. So, but 20 years is enough. Uh, I don't really want to expose myself to life and death decisions like I used to make. Mm. You rem- I don't know if you remember, but somebody's, some operator's voice would go up mm-hmm. and I would go over and do what I could, you know. Right. To help them get through that moment while still making sure that customer got the help they needed, mm. ambulance, fire truck, police, whatever they needed, and keep the operator from straying, mm. you know. Okay, yeah, so you it was almost like you had two jobs with one action because you had to maintain the operator or the agent kind of calm and collected, and also you had to take care of the emergency happening at the moment. Yes. Both at the same time. Yes. But there's background activity. You've got to avoid lawsuits. Mm. And you've got to make sure that the correct decisions are made in the correct order. Mm. I, you, do you remember the two ways? Yes. So we had an event where somebody was heard over the two way. Mm-hmm. Help, 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 help. That's all. And I'm... One one person was dispatching. The other person was talking over the two-way. And I'm in between. And, you know, public agencies, 911 operators, of course, they're going to take the call. But you got to be careful about the decisions they make. Mm. So this 911 operator was, was interpreting what this person said and was only going to send police. And I intervened. I said, send everybody. Mm. Well, why? I said, all we know is help. Mm-hmm. We don't know if this person's in medical jeopardy. We don't know if there's a fire in there. We don't know if there's an intruder in that house. So he got back on that line off the mute button and said, send everybody. Mm-hmm. That, what you do by the details within that alarm. But you also avoid lawsuits. So I don't remember if you, you would have been there, I believe, when this event happened where they used to call them lift assists. So a person, and it happens every day all across the country, people fall out of bed or they fall out of the chair or whatever, Mm. and they need help getting up. And typically, most public agencies, they just send police. So what they do is they question you, and they say, so the person fell down, right? And they're telling us they're not hurt, right? We'll send the police couple of policemen come over, pick you up, put you back in the chair. Everybody's happy. Well, this particular event, the person fall down, told our operator, I'm not hurt. I just need help out. (laughs) That operator, the the dispatching operator, uh, told these things to 911. They said, oh, so you have a lift assist. And the operator agreed. (laughs) The police get over there, pick the person up, Broken hip. And here come the lawsuits. Mm. So they went after the public agency. The public agency played their recording. Said that monotronics operator agreed to lift assist. Mm. So then the lawsuit came at monotronics. We did not do well. So what I did is I grabbed everybody on my ship. Took them in. In groups. We do not use that term, and we do not accept that term. Mm. Well, what do we do? What do we do? I said, here's what you do after you've questioned this person. I have a person that's on the floor or whatever, and they're not reporting injuries at this time. Mm. Don't let that agency operator divert you into agreeing to anything. You have a person not reporting injuries. And in fact, I made a medical dispatch, exact same scenario later, and the 911 operator tried to push me into 
you have a lift assist, you have a lift assist. I said, ma'am, no, I didn't say, I didn't use that term. And I kept repeating to her, I didn't use that term. Mm -hmm. Finally, she says, well, okay, I'll send an ambulance. So you learn to interact with the public agencies. Right. And I could tell you stories all day long, but it's, it's one of those things where I'm in my position mm. having to make sure that the customer is helped in, in whatever we believe is necessary mm -hmm. while still making sure the operator is safe by what they say and the company is safe from the lawsuits right. and it just goes on and on. I, you know, all those years of doing that, I learned about 911 agency operators. I learned about, you know, the whole thing, the legalities. The and, lingo. Mm -hmm. You to be very careful what you say. No doubt. So then after the alarm industry, where did you go the next? Oh, I, I, uh, when I got out of the alarm, I went to California and I just wanted to go there. I lived there as a kid, mm. but I wanted to go there and, you know, try it out. And so I have family out there. Mm. So I went with them and I got, I had uh, previously worked as a hotel night auditor at one time, a long time ago. So I got a job uh, on a military base in a military hotel night auditor just to kind of go along, pay the way, whatever. I did that for a while. And then I said, no, I think I'll go back to Texas. So I came back here. I sold cars at one point, worked in different places and worked in a cell phone refurbishment place. And now I'm working in an electronics refurbishment company um, that supplies some big names, big companies. Mm -hmm. And they ship their stuff in, we refurbish it and send it back out. But nice. I uh, had the opportunity to apply for a supervisor slot, even though I'd never done production. Mm. And I ended up landing that job. So that's what I'm doing currently. I'm known as a production supervisor. Excuse me. And it's, it's not the alarm world. So I don't miss all that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so you moved a bit when, while well, you were young, you mentioned you were, you last, you, you graduated from New Mexico. Yeah. High school in New Mexico. Started in Minneapolis and we, I got relatives all over Minnesota. A huge amount of relatives. Vast majority of Minnesota. Mm. So born in my young life there. We moved to Arizona, lived in Phoenix, back to Minneapolis. Then we moved from Minneapolis to uh, California. And in California, my mom remarried uh, an Air Force person. And then from there, he was stationed in New Mexico. So there we went. And that's where I finalized my childhood. Okay. How was uh, your experience uh, rem when you remember moving or having to move? Was it an exciting moment or how was how did you take it at the time? Or was it different every time? I didn't I didn't mind it a bit. I didn't. Uh, we were we were poor. I mean, we were really poor. And at one stage, uh, we lived in the city projects in Minneapolis and with the riots that had happened there, mm. that kind of neighborhood is where I where we we lived in the city projects. In fact, they were they were so bad the city ended up knocking them down. But yeah, it, mm. it was what it was. My mom did her best, and uh, I didn't care at all mm. about moving around. Um, at one point in time, we lived up in the mountains. Well, we lived on this little ranch. <laughs> it was cool. That was one of the, my favorite spots as a kid. We lived on this little small ranch, mm -hmm. and we had animals, and we had an orchard, and we had different things going on. And from that canyon, you could look down into what's called the Tularosa Basin, and they have is there's a national monument there, the White Sands National Monument, white gypsum sand, out in the middle of the desert. It's a national monument. Mm -hmm. You could see in you know look down. You could see the sand blowing around. You could see the white sands. Beautiful, gorgeous, wonderful place. Then we moved further up in the mountains. And uh, 
that was really rural. And then we moved back onto the base. So I moved around a lot. Okay. Do you have any siblings? Oh, I got five. Five. Where do you land in the spectrum? I am the fifth. The fifth. The youngest. The youngest. Yeah. Okay. How was your relationship with your siblings? We're estranged. Okay. Even growing up? Um, no, not really. We sort of with my oldest sister. She, I don't even know how old she is anymore. She's got to be coming up on 70. Uh, I got one brother. Uh, and then the my other sisters. We tolerated each other for the most part. And everybody scattered. And then when my mother died, that was, well, even before she passed away, there was not really much. Then after that, everybody just went their own way. Why do you think? Why, why do you think that happened? Why do you think, how, like, why do you think the, the relationship was never really there? Well, my oldest two, my oldest sister and my brother, they were out of the hippie era. And they did whatever they did. She disappeared, popped up once or twice, and she didn't have anything to do with anybody. My brother, um, he's a self-made millionaire, actually twice. But he was, he had controlling people in his life. And that, that uh, his, this one person was really controlling, and she drove a wedge between my brother and my mother and then he didn't have anything to do with any of us. So it was, that's an ugly story. Mm. But how he estranged me was uh, 1985, I think. He convinced me that I should go back to Minneapolis and you can stay with us and great jobs and this and that and the other. Okay, so I did that. Rode a bus up there. And I did not know that his wife did the same to me in a, in a personal way. So it's Minneapolis in January is really harsh. Mm. We have very, very mild winters here. We don't, it's just <laughs> almost laughable when you compare the two. Mm -hmm. In Minneapolis, the every calendar day of January, it goes below zero. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of snow, a lot of everything. It's real winter, and it, that winter up there will kill you if you if you're not cautious and mm -hmm. careful. So one day, I mean, I'm working along, and I got laid off whatever job I had. And I thought her and I got along well, but she come flying out of the kitchen this one night, and she said, "Either he goes or I go." Mm -hmm. And my brother said, "You're out." That quick. So before they go to bed, he said, you'll be gone by the morning, right? Yeah. Now, he lives like five miles outside of town. <laughs> so I grabbed my little bag, and I started walking in the snow, and it was so cold I couldn't believe it. So anyway, long story short, I get to this bus station. I drop my bag off. The guy said, you can leave it here. I'll be back in a few days to get a bus ticket to New Mexico in my bag. And he said, that's fine. Leave your bag. Then I had to walk from there with the suburb of Minneapolis all the way to another suburb. I was huge. I walked all night long in that cold, below zero. And so by the time I get to the town I had worked in, it was still dark, right? And there was one of those little plexiglass bus stop things, right? And I thought, well, you know what? I'll get warmer this is when I'm starting to slip. I'll get warmer if I step inside this little thing. Hmm. And in front of me, now this didn't go good, right? No good. <laughs> yeah. But in my head, I'm starting to, you know, there's a gas station here, gas station here. It's dark, pitch dark, and snowing and cold. And then I see, like, this station over here, <laughs> somebody opens the door. Right. Now remember, it's locked up and closed. Opens the door, comes out with these Joe Cool sunglasses on, and no shirt, and he's sunning himself by the light of the moon. And I said, "No, <laughs> this can't, you know." <laughs> yeah. 
And then it kind of just went away. And then I look over here, there's another gas station. And I see somebody fiddling around with the gas pumps. So being Mr. Good Citizen, <laughs> I went over there. Now I'm fiddling around with the gas pumps, right? And I, I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to get arrested. What am I doing over here? So I ran back across the street to the bus stop. And then I realized something's wrong. Hmm. Something not right in my head. And th these delusions or whatever. So I'm telling myself, you're in trouble. You're in real trouble here. I'm going into shock, right? Hyperbic shock, whatever. Okay. So then I realized, wait a minute. Maybe I'm in the twilight zone. Now, this has really happened to me. Maybe I'm in the twilight zone, right? Or maybe I'm already dead. Mm. But if that's the case, my driver's license got his address on it. And that was my revenge moment. Like, you killed me. And I'm thinking, okay, so you killed me. My driver's license got your address. You're going to find out about it when they find me. That was my state of mind. Okay. So, uh, eventually the workers came in. This guy over here let me into his garage. I couldn't believe it. And I freaked him out because he's going to clock in, and I'm right on his tail like this. And he's looking around. What are you doing? I said, I don't know. I'm just, you know. He goes, no, you need to leave. I said, oh, man. I said, it's cold out there. I said, I've been out here all night. I said, I don't go back to that cold. He said, right behind that bus stop is a restaurant, and they're open. I said, no, no, I was over there. There's no restaurant. Over there. Yeah, there is. So here I go. And I see all these people in the restaurant, right? Hmm. And then I thought to myself, well, they're not going to let me in there. They're having a, a stockholder meeting, board of directors, and they're not going um, to. This was what I was thinking. Okay. So I walk in, and the waitress, she takes one look at me, fills my, you know, the whole restaurant's watching me. And I took that blazing hot coffee and just drank it down. Didn't even feel it. <laughs> That's how cold I was. Wow. Anyway, long story short, that day I went to the place, picked up my final check. And then I walked all the way back to Anoka, where my bag was. I bought my bus ticket to go to New Mexico. Mm. And then I had enough to buy a, a plate of spaghetti. I never ate the spaghetti. Next thing I know, some guy is waking me up. My face was in the spaghetti. He's waking me up. He says, you're going to miss your bus. So I'm trying to clean my face up <laughs> and get on the bus to get out of there. Oh, it was, uh, I said some ugly things about my brother, you know. And my mom, when she found out, I mean, because I had to tell her what happened, because she took me in. Mm. That was one of my hidden homeless moments. That And that group exists, the hidden homeless. The hidden homeless. That's a real group. People are all the time talking about the homeless. I'm there. I get it. But you have hidden homeless. So if if she hadn't let me stay in her house, I'd have stayed under a bridge. That's mm -hmm. hidden homeless. That's the hidden homeless. So it's a category you have, right. to, you have to actually research. But okay. Anyway, so I get back to New Mexico, and I'm right back at the same restaurant, cranking out my three dollars an hour, you know. And then from there is how I ended up coming here. And as I said, when I got here, I'm malnourished, and, and so. I had it pretty tough. Yeah, no kidding. And <laughs> I told this when I was at Monotronics, they did this little group thing. And we had to partner with people and tell stories. And so I'm telling this guy, he told me his, and I said, what's your story? I, and the I, only thing I could come up with was that I rode my bike 600 miles from Mexico to Fort Worth. And he says, what size bike is this? I said, 200 cc. He looks at me and he goes, they make scooters more powerful than that. And I never thought about it. Mm. He goes, you rode a scooter 600 miles? I never considered it that way, but he was right. Or there's a will, there's that's, a way. That's all I had. Yeah. And I landed in town with 30 bucks. But this was after these other experiences I told you about. So I had a, I had a challenging young adulthood, and I am blessed that 
I had two parents who cared mm -hmm. because the, dis the, the discipline that they enforced in, in my childhood got me through that period of my life. I'm glad you're going there because I was just going to ask about what kind of um, rules you lived by in, in your home because uh, I feel like that's usually what starts shaping us as a person. So what was like, what kind of rules did you have to abide by in your, in your house? And you just mentioned the disciplines that were kind of what, passed down to you. What was that like? My mother, previous to my stepfather, my mom really ran a tight ship. Mm. And she would tell us all the time, I'm not your friend. I'm your mother. And my goal is to make sure that you can survive in the world when I'm gone. Mm. So every one of you will know how to run a house, how to take care of yourself, how to do all the stuff before you leave my house. Well, to give you an example, she had a rule. I find a dirty dish. All the dishes come out, all of them. And you get to wash and dry and put them back. My mom had a lot of dishes, a lot of pots and pans, a lot of silverware, no dishwasher. This was by hand, old school. So one night we were all sleeping and she woke us all up, found a dirty dish, mm. get on it, and we got on it. And wash every single... And everything in that kitchen. Everything. Yes. By hand. Oh, okay. That happened maybe once or twice. You know, and she enforced it. Mm-hmm. So, um, she always used to say, you don't have to like me and you don't have to love me, but you will respect me mm. in my home. And she, she lived by that. So... We, we were all given chores. You will do these chores. You will do them right. Mm. And we did them. And my mom, she started real early. She told me later. She said, you got to get in early. How early? Uh, well, I started doing chores five or six years old. Okay. Yeah. But she told me, too, that if you don't have a child under control by 12 or something, forget it. Mm. You've lost it. So my mom... And I loved the hell out of her, and she was so right about things, you know? Mm. So by the time I, whatever I was, eight, nine years old, it's just normal. You come home, you do your chores, you do your homework. Glenn, did you get your homework done? Yeah, let me see it. And she ran a really solid ship, and that gave me discipline. And then, of course, the rules being what they were, if if in the early days we got the belt, right? Okay. And my mom was a real big believer about the face slap. <laughs> <laughs> she really she utilized that. Uh, I had this one sister got herself in trouble, and my mom was giving her the back and forth, and then she says, "Well, Glenn did such and such." And I'm standing down the hallway, and she turned around and looked at me. I was, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> she came out of there shot like a gun, man. I got the back and forth. <laughs> yep. Oh, man, that's not funny, but it, it kind of is. <laughs> well, probably now it is. No, it is funny now. But you kind of learned that you didn't want to go back for more. Mm-hmm. And so if she gave me that look or said, hey, hey, you know, then you knew. Right. And that didn't happen too many times in my childhood. I got the idea. Mm. And then so when she married my stepfather, he was a, used to be a Green Beret in Vietnam, the Fifth Special Forces. And what, what, what is that? What a, green, a Green Beret is like a SEAL. But the army version, they're elite. Okay, okay. They're like a force multiplier military counter. They're the best. Mm. They're, they're mm -hmm. just the best. And if you grow up in a home with prior military, uh, you usually get better discipline anyway. But he was a stickler. I mean, he just didn't. So he always called me boy. 
boy, go take care of this boy. And he worked me. I was working. I mean. How did that make you feel? Well, um, he taught me a lot. But being a kid, I wanted to do kid things. Mm. And he didn't see it that way. Like, man, nah, you're just going to get yourself in trouble. So he taught me a lot of stuff. I look back on that, man. I am so thankful. But, boy, boy this, boy that, boy the other. <laughs> <laughs> that was my name, boy. <laughs> yeah. But he had a reason for that, mm. which is the hierarchy. You know, that, that's important. If you want to remain master in your own home, mm. which is critical with children, if you're not careful, they're running the show, mm. and they do all the usual things kids do. So I think his vantage point was you're not the parent. You're not in charge, and the hierarchy is I'm the adult in the room, and you're the child, right? Right. Makes perfect sense. But to maintain that, you keep repeating that. Mm -hmm. So he gave me a huge amount of discipline. I mean, and, and I never challenged him. I mean, he, I was something, I was doing something off the wall. I'm not going to go into that, but I was doing something off the wall and he discovered it. And all I had was fist and boots. I'll never forget that. <laughs> I ended up at the base of this tree and he said, well, when you can get up, come talk to me. Oh, when you can get up. Oh, yeah. He, it was no joke. And discipline was different back in those days. And um, wow. so we worked it out. He's like, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, and you're not supposed to be getting into all this off-the-wall stuff. I'm not going to tolerate it. And so, And I used to call him a one-hit wonder because being a Green Beret, he, mm -hmm. could, he could do things. Right? Mm -hmm. And I would do something off the wall. I'd never see him move. I just kind of saw a blur. And then I'd be landing over there somewhere, and he'd say, "Watch your mouth, boy." Uh, or and then they got into watch your tone. Mm. My mom would say, "I want you to go do whatever," and I go, "Okay." Mm. Watch your tone. Mm. That's the kind of discipline. And I am so thankful. I am so thankful I was brought up that way, because I had friends, more than people I knew. Parents didn't care. Just don't get me in trouble. Yeah, they just didn't care. My parents cared. Mm. And so they did what I believe a good parent would do, which is you got to raise your kid up where they can survive in the world. Mm. And that's your primary. It's kind of like birds. This is interesting to me. How so? Uh, birds learn to fly. Mm. They don't naturally fly, but they have the instinct. But they don't know how to fly. And the mama bird, there's the nest. Mama goes out, gets the worms or whatever she feeds them. And I was interesting because I was studying this. At some point, the mama bird starts backing away down the branch. A little further and a little further, which means that the baby bird's got to, if he wants to eat, he's got to step out. Right. Or he ain't going to eat. Right. So mama is backing up, backing up, backing up. At some stage of the game, right, mm. uh, you got to learn to fly. So either he, he or she, the bird, gets bumped off the branch or mama takes her beak and out of the nest they go. Mm. You got from that branch to that ground to learn how to fly. And the mortality rate on birds is incredible if, I mean, in certain instances. But I think about the mother bird, and you, can you imagine, she has to do this. Because they have to know how to fly. Right. Or they die, or they basically. Die. They're going to die if they don't know how to fly. So her and her maternal instinct has to do this. Can you imagine the bird, bop, <laughs> she comes down and the bird's dead. And that's her baby. Can you imagine, even if it's just a bird, they're, so I've always believed that all you really need to do is watch the animals. And how they take care of their young. Mm. And the big shocker is animals don't coddle their offspring. They don't do that. 
They do everything they can to ensure the survival of their young. Mm. Right? So, right. But, so it goes to their, their kind of like philosophy, how you live life to survive in a way. If Because they decide that the, the mother bird decides to stick by its values for survival. So they do the tough thing. And if it has, if it means like, you know, pushing their baby bird away and whether it flies or it doesn't, you know, and then if it doesn't, they come down and, and see the, the dead bird. But, but then again, they, they stick to their values and it's more so, it's not values. It's more so instinct, it's, right? It's instinct. Yes. They know. They know. It's like the cats. I, I was fascinated by this. It's, and it's not just big and small cats. House cats all the way up to lions, tigers, whatever. When they have their kittens beyond the very, very initial stage, they run out, they get their prey, they take care of it, they kill the, you know, whatever. And then they bring it back and feed it to their young. And this is what the young are exposed to. Mm -hmm. Mama's feeding them chunks of whatever. And then it goes to the next level where she brings the prey back living. Right? Mm -hmm. And she kills the prey in front of the kittens to show them how this is the how you do this. And 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 it's repeated and they learn the lessons. Then eventually she takes them out to observe the hunting in real time, real life. And they, this is how they learn. And she'll protect her kittens from anybody or anything. That, you know, so what is she doing? She's doing what a mother would do. Right. There's no coddling. Right. And then at some point, be on your way. Because they've been given the survival skills to make it. <laughs> the, to me, it's fascinating that human beings, because we're, we're the superior creature we've strayed away from the lessons of nature mm. and we live in a much more complicated world in a way than other animals because of human complications but the reality is still the same that child is going to face the world mm. did you equip that child with the survival skills to make it in the world the discipline and not worry about, well, I'm your friend, or I'm going to give you toys so you, you know. So I don't want to necessarily expend the energy as a parent to become the bad person or I'm too mean or whatever. One thing I just loved about my parents, they didn't care whether I appreciated what they had to say or not. <laughs> <laughs> they just said, this is the way you're going to live. Okay. So yeah. after I got out of school and I went through that rough patch I told you about, mm -hmm. I made it only because my parents kept that discipline so tight. Now, of course, as I'm growing, they gave me a little more freedom, a little more freedom, a little more freedom. But they made it very clear, we'll take that back if you get in trouble. Okay. You'll be right back in the, you know. So I was so blessed that I had parents that cared and made the right, used the right processes mm. to put me on the right path. So by the time I got out of high school, I was straight as an arrow. I don't break laws. I don't do off the wall stuff. I work hard. I do what I got to do. And, but it all comes back to, you know, you don't build a house from the roof up. Right. You build it from the foundation. Right. Brick upon brick. And that all starts in childhood. Mm. Every bit of that starts in childhood, and if you if you're, uh, it's just amazing. I've seen that a lot in my jobs, where you see people who. It's not to say the parents didn't care, right? Right. Or that they didn't love their kids. That's not. Not cool. what you're saying. Yeah. But if you take the wrong approach, in my opinion, mm -hmm. all I do is look out the window and look at the birds. I can watch the dog and their puppies. I can see the cats. Uh, you know, cattle are that way. Sheep are that way. They're all that way. But there's no coddling, you know. And this whole entitlement thing, it just, not, 
Yeah. So, give, yeah. Me, give me a small example. Yeah. These streets in this town, they're that wide. So people park, you can get one car through. Mm. Somebody's got to pull over, right, in, right. The, in the residential area. And where I live, I do it all the time, and I usually see some of the same cars. So going to work or not, I'll zip over to the right, right? Some people, they give the nonverbal thank you with mm. the wave. I return it. Other people just, <laughs> unless they're having some kind of weird life problem or they're sick, headache, whatever. To me, that shows an entitlement attitude. Mm. You're mm -hmm. entitled. I didn't have to pull over. I could have right. pushed my way through. Shows entitlement. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about entitlement, I learned this. because I taught myself this, right? Mm. I would say I'm entitled to nothing. Mm. And I mean nothing. Okay. And because I'm not entitlement-minded, I have a true appreciation and gratitude for anything anybody does for me. Mm. I really do. But if I'm entitlement-minded and I didn't get my entitlement, what does that mean? Now I get mad. Mm. You, know, maybe you didn't give me what I... No, no. I don't see life that way. And because I don't have an entitlement attitude, uh, I had a friend, he's since passed away, but he used to tell me, people don't have to do anything for you. Not not meaning me personally. Right. But he was a great philosopher. But these people don't do anything for you. Where's this idea come that people, and he opened my eyes to that topic. And I was raised with no entitlement. That's probably where I picked up this idea. Mm. That's part of the discipline my parents used. It was just kind of ingrained in you. Now, your your siblings, um, how how was how was? I mean, they they still lived in the in the same household, right? Did they get in trouble much? Did you learn from from maybe from a little bit from their mistakes since you were the youngest? How was uh? Did they? How was how was their relationship with with your parents? Since there was there's different different heads, different. Mind, you know, I'm sure some got in trouble, some didn't. I, I wonder what your experience is looking back. My oldest sister and my brother, they were out of the hippie era. So there's a little bit of, I mean, I remember it all, but there's a little bit of a separation. But they both kind of got in trouble in their way. I mean, nothing overly serious, but they got, they got into some trouble. And my mother uh, was a lot easier on them than she was on the four youngest. Mm -hmm. She really made us walk the talk. Rick and uh, my brother and my older sister, you know, they, they just kind of had a good time. Mm -hmm. And I think that she, she never said this, but I think that she decided, no, that's not the way to go. Okay. So the my three sisters and myself walked the talk. Okay. And now with that being said, there was one sister, the one in California. She would get into some trouble. She never got in legal trouble, but she got into trouble. And she was very difficult to contain and control. And, and it was just kind of hard on the family. Uh, my other two sisters, nah, they, no real problems. Mm. And uh, I, I got, a, I had a few moments, but. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So you, you weren't a yeah uh, like a no troublemaker there was there was times where you got in trouble i did yeah okay i did get in trouble as a matter of fact uh, i think i it, it's it's kind of a it's not a funny story but sort of i don't know <laughs> so as a kid i don't know why this happened i to this day nobody knows why it happened but my first fist fights were literally five, six years old, mm -hmm. literally. And that carried all the way through to the 10th grade in high school, my last fight. I was fighting all the time. Mm -hmm. But nobody ever could show I started anything. And my mother was like, what's with, you know? I said, I don't know, it's something to do with my face. So 
Um, so she was constantly getting phone calls from the school. <laughs> <laughs> Come get your son. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, a fighter, huh? Yeah, it. I got so sick of that. I, I really did. I, even my friends would say, we don't understand. We're walking down the hallway. Nobody bothered my friends. They, But they started on me. Oh, okay. So I forget what year it was. Maybe, no. Uh, so I, I'm doing all this fighting. Mm-hmm. In the 10th grade, I got into a fight with a guy in a restroom. And I wanted all these fighting. This fighting to stop. But I couldn't quite figure out how to do it. So... Uh, there's a theory, and it works, uh, that you take on the biggest guy, right, and you pound him, and the other guys get the lesson, mm. and it does work. So I got into a fight with this guy, and we're in the, this restroom, and I lost my temper, and of course he's hit me. So I grabbed him by his hair, and I picked him up like this off the floor. Well, when I did that, I damaged my right shoulder, mm. and I broke the rotator cuff. Well, my arm's just hanging there. I couldn't do anything with it. I, I couldn't. Right. I mean, there it, it is. Yes, yeah. But then I start taking his head and bashing it on my knee. <laughs> 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 so down the hallway, we had a couple of football. You know how that is? A couple of football coaches who also teach class well. What are you going to do, right? So they came in, broke it up, and all that. And I hoped that that was it. Mm -hmm. That wasn't it. No. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's funny when I look back on it. (laughs) Oh, gosh. So I was so aggravated, like, what is this? I mean, I I I didn't really hurt this kid. I hurt myself more because of that shoulder. Yeah. But word travels. So... There was another guy, he went to another school, but he came to my school for uh, basketball, I think. Big, big dude. And him and I never got along. Ball player, all that. Big deal. And um, so he rode my bus in, and then I would ride that same bus back to the base. And one day we almost got into it, but we didn't. I got on the bus, away we went. So the next day, he's there. And I was actually, my last course uh, of the day was typing. So I remember that. And I'm sitting in that typing class, and I'm thinking, man, I know I'm going to get into it with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> sure, and it's by the student parking lot, right? Mm-hmm. There it is, all these buses. And he climbs off the bus, and he said some ugly things. And... Uh, and and I'm standing there, and I'm shaking like a leaf. You're and, mad. And he, yeah, he said, oh, you're scared. Mm. I said, I'm real scared. <laughs> oh, because, yeah, I was full of adrenaline. Mm. And he hit me. And then it was on. And, man, we went round and round. And this is a big dude. He's in good health, good shape, ball team and all that. He's much bigger than me. But I'm planning in my head... I'd already done that. Mm. What I was going to do if. Mm -hmm. So finally, I'm on top of him on the ground. I grabbed his afro and I started on the pavement. (laughs) (laughs) So, so so his, it was real ugly. I mean, there were some ugly things happening there. And uh, somebody yelled cops. So I I go to get up, right? And Mm -hmm. he got up. And I thought, this I'm fed up with this, right? I hit that guy as hard as I could hit him. And he went back through the air and landed on some bike racks. Hit his head. Now he can't get up. He literally cannot stand up. So his friends go over there. And he do all this. And his friends are going, you're finished, man. <laughs> so that was my final fight. And what was interesting was, I'm in the 12th grade now, mm-hmm. and I had a couple of people. This great big man, he's bigger than the door. Literally, he was huge, and he had a regular sized guy friend with him. Mm-hmm. And they were trying to start a fight with me, throwing rocks at my head and this and that. And I plotted it out. 
I was going to do it. And <laughs> so the day that he walks by me and he threw rocks at me again, the big guy, mm -hmm. they had this old timey metal stool. I don't know if you remember them, but they were pretty, they were metal with a wooden seat. Very heavy. We had one up at the top front of the class. I strategically, I waited for him to sit down. And then I got up and I went up and I grabbed that stool. Now I'm full of adrenaline again, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm waving it in the air with like this. <gasps> and everybody's flipped out. I, yeah. I said, you're dead. I said, you are dead. I'm going to get you. After this class is over, and I'm waving this thing, right? And then his friend Steve, he's there, and I said, you too. <laughs> I told him, I said, yeah, you're dead. His eyes were like this, because he's like a regular guy. <laughs> then I put the thing down, and I went back to my seat, and I'm going, oh, my God, I hope it works. <laughs> I hope it works. <laughs> so there were people in that class who were friends of the guy I got in the parking lot. There were some cowboys in there. I'd had a couple of them and other groups. And I'm sitting there in that chair, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, he's going to kill me. One hit from that guy, I'd be, you know. Then they started on him, which is part of my plan. They said, you know, he's crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is David Osterholt. That was his name. He's like, oh, no, I can take him. Oh, no, no, no. That guy is crazy. Do you, did you know what he did to so-and-so? Did you see that fight in the parking lot? Mm. Did you remember the fight in the bathroom? Do you remember the fight here and there? That guy is crazy. And I'm thinking, thank God. Thank God! <laughs> <laughs> and so, Steve, the other guy, he's all looking around like nothing what to do. And they sold it. All these guys sold it. They did my work for me. Next thing you know, they run over to the teacher and said, we get a hall pass. Just leave early. <laughs> <laughs> and she wrote out the passes and they split. So then she calls me over. Now remember, now today they'd arrest you for this kind of stuff. But she didn't, she, when she was sitting at her desk when this was happening, she was just frozen. So she calls me, what, what happened? What happened? I told her. Oh, my God, I didn't know what to do. Oh, my God, look, <laughs> you gave them the hall pass, they're gone. So now they never came near me again. Mm. They never bothered me again. Nobody bothered me again, which was my goal. Yes. That was the end of it. So my last fight was in the 10th grade. And that theory mm -hmm. had worked. Mm -hmm. So I told my nephew, I said, you don't ever want to fight everybody. Right when they needed the big guy. The, there's no good thing that comes out of mm -hmm. violence. You don't want to be involved in that. But if you have to defend yourself, right, mm -hmm. you do some damage because you don't want them coming back. Mm -hmm. And that, when I was in high school, that, that, that happened. And so, get this, I graduated, I was over at this Denny's, and the big guy, he showed up, right? Now, we're out of school, right? And all like that. I'm thinking, oh, goodness, right? <laughs> <laughs> there he is. <laughs> there he is. So he sits a couple seats down and, hey, Glenn, how's it going? I greeted him. He said, you remember when we were in speech class and you threatened to do that to me? <laughs> yeah. Well... He said, I deserved it. Mm -hmm. You would have been right to do that. I'm so very sorry. And, and I'm like, wow. You know? Mm -hmm. but, I, but I was so thankful that that yeah. part of my life went away. Do you feel like it kind of chased you? Like people would just kind of pick on you and pick these fights? or it's Part of it was, well, I would say this. A lot of it's my face. Why do you think? Because I'll put it to you this way. If I encounter a cop, he gives me the business. He, he's looking me over. This has always been this way. He thinks I'm some kind of criminal or some kind of a problem. Mm. If I encounter criminals, 
You know what they think? I'm a cop. <laughs> oh. It's amazing. <laughs> and that's been my life. I mean, going all the way back, to, you know. So, uh, yeah, that's the way it is. And so I remember at Monotronics and other companies I worked at where they would bring in the new people and they'd get that look. Mm. And I overheard operators telling the new people, oh, he's fine. No, what? <laughs> <laughs> really, I heard this. <laughs> people have this natural, oh, my goodness, uh, this guy is terrible or mean or whatever. Mm. And other people, I overheard people. No, no, Glenn's a good guy. He's not, you know, it's the way my face is built. But interesting, yeah, because I've had that experience too many times with police officers, mm -hmm. and I've had it too many times around criminal elements. So, to give you an example, now, this uh, forget his name, doesn't matter. Me and this other guy at Smith Alarm, mm -hmm. you know, working at Smith Alarm at one point, and he wants to go over to the adult entertainment places, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to go home. No, 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 you got to go with me. Oh, that's, ah, okay. Well, we go in, and it's kind of like an amphitheater setting, right? Mm -hmm. So the entertainment's down here, the, the back here. So we get up, and we're sitting at a table toward the back. And I hear these guys say, hey, 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 these two guys just walked in here. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. So then I hear somebody <laughs> on the radio calling down to people on the floor. Hey, guys, be careful. We got cops in here. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I go sailing through an intersection, and a cop sees me. This happened a while back. Here he comes. Pulls me over. Just checking me out. Right? Hmm. Yeah. That's the way it is. Wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Did you, growing up, did you have any, like, aspirations to be anything like any dreams i wanted to be a lawyer a lawyer what 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 made you want to be a lawyer what about a lawyer their lawyers basically are, are what you might call wordsmiths yeah. right mm -hmm. locksmiths mm -hmm. and so on. they're wordsmiths mm -hmm. and they know how to arrange their verbiage written, vocal, whatever, to make it fit in such a way that either you can't get out, they got you in there, locked in, or maybe if they're a good lawyer on the other side of the spectrum, they can find the loopholes where you where other lawyers didn't use the right words. Mm -hmm. And so that was always what I had wanted to do. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, I can see that because you, if anybody is good with their words that I know, it's you. Well, well, thank you. I'll tell you a couple of quick stories. Yes. When I moved to California, California, going into California, not, not on the side roads, little minor roads, but if you're on the big, big interstates and stuff like that, it's almost like going into another country. You got all these ports and you drive through and they stop you and they, you got any fruit, vegetables, animals, whatever you got, right? Of course, they all got cameras, mm -hmm. see? So they know when you enter the state. Mm -hmm. Now, this is important because they like to you know, give you all kinds of fees and fines and all that. <laughs> <laughs> they really shake you down. I mean, you, you're going to pay some money. Mm -hmm. So when I get there, my sister says uh, she had moved to another state at some point in time, came back. And she told the state, I was only here for a couple of weeks, and they processed her. And she told me, well, I'd been there a while. And she said, you need to tell them you've only been here a couple of weeks. I said, no. Well, I said, first of all, they captured my license plate coming through the state when I got here. Mm. They just got to punch it in. They'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> now you're in trouble, right? <laughs> But also, we'd gone to the beach in San Diego County and went down to a place called Oceanside. And my, I allowed, foolishly, 
I allowed my nephew to park the truck. He parks it just on the white line. So when I come back, I got a ticket. <laughs> hey. So now I got to pay the ticket. So I told her, I said, I already had a ticket. <laughs> they know I'm here. Yeah. And they know when I got here. So I'm not about to tell the state that I got here two weeks ago. Well, you're gonna get, they're going to get you with all kinds. And that's true because the way their computer system's set up, <clears throat> the way it's supposed to do it, the way it's supposed to do it mm. is when you establish residency or you've been there a given period of time. But their system was set up, the, the, the software was set up to catch you uh, when you cross the state line. Mm. That's where they get you. And I figured it out. So what I did is I went to the FAQs for this, okay. printed them out, and I highlighted all the stuff. And so then, <laughs> so I was telling everybody, I'm going to get, oh, I know what it was. I went to DMV, I got the driver's license, and then a week later or something, I went to register it, and they gave me this huge bill, like $800 or something. It was crazy. Here I pay $50 a year, and there I'm going to be that's how I. That's how that whole thing started. Mm. Anyway, so I went and highlighted everything. And what applied to me was when I established my driver's license, which had been a couple of weeks past or whatever it was. And it, I wrote in in the narrative. I said, I was only in California for an extended vacation. Mm. True, mm. I had not intended to stay. Then I changed my mind, got my license, and that established my residency. Mm. See? Mm. And I told everybody I knew, watch me get my money back. Oh, no, nobody beats California DMV. It doesn't happen. It does not happen. Fair enough. Oh, a couple of weeks go by, and there's my check. So I showed it to everybody. <laughs> you told me I couldn't do this. There it is, right? And then a friend of mine, he's since passed away. But he got tangled up with a bank problem and had to change banks. But he was retired on Social Security. So anyway, I had to talk Social Security into giving him a paper check. They didn't want to do it. Oh, we have our rules and all that. Well, I talked. He got his paper check. Then he takes it over to whatever bank he was using at the time, and they put a hold on it, and he couldn't get his money. He's all upset. Oh, understandable. I said, well, let me talk to the bank. So they got whoever on the phone, and uh, I did my footwork. So I says, well, you know, this is a 70-some-year-old man. He lives on Social Security, and he gave you a U.S. Treasury check for the amount of, and you put a hold on it? How does that work? Mm-hmm. Well, it's in our user agreement, and it's on our website, and this and that. And I said, let me explain reality. <laughs> I said, U.S. code number. Boom, 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 boom. Like, oh. I said, I'm not interested in your user agreement, and nor am I interested in your website. Mm. The law is mm. that if you take a treasury check, and there are certain others, and that person, it's below whatever figure it was. If that person goes into your bank and personally deals with a teller, you cannot legally put a hold on that money. Mm -hmm. U.S. code number, whatever, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, uh, well, let me let me go check on this and that. So considerable amount of time goes by, you know, 10, 15 minutes, person comes back. Well, we don't want to be responsible or feel guilty about a 70-some-year-old man can't get his money, so we lifted the hold. Good for you. Mm, good choice. Make sure you notify your legal department. U.S. code number. <laughs> Remove it from your website. So, yeah, Tom, he couldn't believe it. He used to work for banks. Mm. He said, I've never seen anybody beat a bank. I don't know. I said, it's just the law. I mean, you know, I, I did my footwork. I studied it. There you are. It pays wonders, doesn't it? I mean, it, it's amazing because so many people don't know that. They just don't realize that just because an organization says this is our rule, 
doesn't make it so. Right. And it, it, in Tom's case, it really, I mean, he had to have his money. Yeah, I think I think the issue with with that is not knowing. People don't know what to do when 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 maybe they get they don't get the answer they want, and then maybe they don't know how to do the research, um, or maybe they don't even think about doing the research to begin with, right? So, how did you learn how to just kind of do your homework? Where did that start in your life, or have you always been that way? Or was there a lesson you you learned that taught you that? Well, I used to. <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe, maybe I just came by it. I don't remember. It is, I remember I had a whatever class it was two years ago, seventh grade, maybe seventh or eighth grade, whatever it was. I had this teacher, mm. real young, and she thought she was all whatever, mm. and uh, so. She would try to push this idea about how wonderful she was. I didn't like her. <laughs> so she would say things, and I would say, oh, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and this one day, I just kept saying whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Everything she said, I'd say whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a good time with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh huh. So sorry. Continue. So now, now I'm doing this in front of the whole class, right? I mean, I'm I'm having, I'm having fun with it. She gets so exasperated that she says, "If you say whatever to me one more time, you're gonna I'm gonna remove you from class, and you won't be back today." <laughs> And I looked at her, I said, whatever. <laughs> I did that. So then she becomes all large and in charge, right? Well, class, now I, you heard me tell him, no, no, he's not coming back to this class. Blah, 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 blah. There we go. So we get to the principal's office. And door closed, and she says, his name's Jones. Well, Mr. Jones, you know, blah, 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 and she starts grinding on about all this. He listened to her, and then he says, well, Glenn, what do you have to say about this? Well, well, gee whiz, Mr. Jones, I don't know. I, I, I don't know too many words, and I don't know how to... When I get under stress, uh, she got me upset, and I didn't know what to say. I just run out of words. I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I just said whatever, and she, here we are. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> he goes, okay, Glenn, go on back to class. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so everybody looked up when I came back. Oh, you're back, right? <laughs> oh, that that's that's a good story. And so when she comes back, because she eventually came back, okay, she'd been gone a while. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that conversation didn't go well with her and that principal. <laughs> So she finally got all meek as a mouse, and she you could tell she was angry. Mm. <laughs> She'd already told everybody I was gone. I wouldn't be back. But that mm. didn't go that way. So I made this riding crop, right, a handmade riding crop in the mm. shop class. Mm. And I'd, you know, Colonel Clink from Hogan's Heroes, I'd walk around with my little riding crop, right? And sometimes the girls would go by, and I'd go, you know, whatever. I had my fun with it. So <laughs> this friend of mine worked in the library, and sh that teacher was in the library one day. This was after the business with the principal. Mm. So I come strutting in there with my riding crop, and then I'm banging on the counter. Come on, hurry up. Let's get out of here. And she grabbed the riding crop on this end of it. What are you doing? 
you're not supposed to have that. I said, who says? <laughs> and then I said, I thought I'll play with it, right? So I took that riding crop and I started bending it because she's got the other end and it's starting to bow. So go ahead and break my personal property. You're going to break my personal property and then I'm going to go see Mr. Jones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you should have been a lawyer. Pretty good with words. Yeah. I had my fun. Oh, God, that is, that's so good. Did you have any teachers you, you looked up to or any teachers that, that helped you in some way or, or form along the way? I had a government teacher, a government history teacher. I had him in two courses. Uh, Puglis, his name, Mr. Puglis. Really admired him. He, he was really good teacher. I liked him really well. He, had, he taught government and he taught history and we had a, we had a good time. Uh, we had a smoking area in my high school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, the smoking area was just near his back where his class was located. They'd be out there smoking away. Well, of course there's a lot of pea gravel out there. Right. And one, another one of those moments where this individual wanted to be funny. So, he pulled a bunch of this pea gravel from that smoking area mm. and he's thrown it at the back of my head. Mm. Turn around and say, cool it, right? And of course he didn't. So what do I do? And I got up and I did my, you know, and Puglis, he's like, Glenn, sit down. Glenn, sit down. And then he, Glenn, sit down. Okay, so I sat down. And then he says, can anybody tell me, uh, and he quoted the Constitution, uh, about the the armed citizen groups. I can't remember the, the, the phraseology. But anyway, he says, Does anybody know what that is? I said, yeah, it's the National Guard. He said, and who said this man wasn't into violence? Because <laughs> he threatened this other guy. Yeah, then were the days. And then I had an a, a accounting teacher mm. who was an old World War II B-17 bomber pilot. Mm. I respected him, and boy, I would talk to him, and I'd, you know, ask him questions and this and that. Kind of, I favored him a lot. Mm -hmm. He, those two teachers were really something. Yeah. How? What? What was the biggest less the takeaway from them? Well, Puglis was was. Um, he knew how to interact with people. Mm. He knew how to deal with different personalities. Okay. And I watched him how he did things, and I mm. thought, "Hey, I can I can figure something out from this." Mm. He looked like Fred Flintstone. He, that his his person looked like Fred Flintstone, and he had this poster on the wall with this multicolored goofball. And every one every once in a while, he'd wear the exact like a blue jacket <laughs> and green pants, and you know, polka dot tie, and you know, he just, and he'd he'd come in and just stand there by the poster <laughs> till everybody got it. You know, it's, it's just cool. Yeah. He's a cool guy. Yeah. I used to skip school once in a while. And uh, and then I turned 18, whatever period of time it was in the year. So we had a steakhouse down the road from the high school. So there we go. Me and my buddies, we'd go down to the steakhouse. And there he sat. Now, we had a, now we didn't know he wasn't in his class, but he'd look at us. Aren't you supposed to be in my class? Yeah, aren't you supposed to be there too? <laughs> he didn't know what to say. <laughs> so he knew we were skipping his class, you know, he was yeah. skipping school, whatever you want to call it. Right. Yeah, he was a good one. And then and then Mr. Haynes, the bomber pilot, uh, he told me stories about the war and mm. that period of time. Oh, man. And uh I have so much respect for that generation. It's beyond belief. But yeah, he yeah he was he he taught me a lot of things about honor mm. and and integrity and living up to certain standards. That was kind of what his role was. Okay, okay. How did you end up buying your your motorcycle that that brought you to Texas? So you graduate and then yeah. you get a job. What I did is I bought this old '68 <clears throat> Ford LTD. Mm. And I scraped and scrimped for months, and it cost me 300 bucks. And it barely ran. But I'd been walking back and forth around the desert forever, so I wanted to get a car. Mm. 
that's the best I could do was this old car. Now, the car was pretty cool. It's really heavy, solid metal, the whole thing, the way they made cars in those days. Great big, uh, big watt V8 and all that. But it had mechanical problems. And, of course, I had no money. Mm. So I took it out to this uh, used car lot, and the guy had that bike. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I'll let you trade it in. It was no money, whatever it was. He, he didn't give me anything for it, not really. But I didn't pay anything for the bike. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, I did, but, you know. Right. But the bike ran better than the car. Mm -hmm. So I got the bike. Mm -hmm. okay. And I went and bought a spare chain, and... Uh, and then my, I had a helmet and then my little bag. Mm. That's how that happened. That's how that, okay. <clears throat> Very nice. What What did you think you were going to do after graduating high school? Did you know you were going to come to Fort Worth or somewhere else? Or did you have any dreams or any, <clears throat> excuse me, aspirations after graduating high school? I did. Um, actually, I had enlisted in the Navy. Mm. That was my big ticket out of poverty, you know, that's a lot of kids will get their trade or whatever they do. So, but, um, uh, my shoulder, the Navy decided that was a pre existing condition. Mm. Go away. Because mm. at that time, it's not like today, they, they, did, they didn't have any problem getting people in. So that just threw me back into poverty, but now I have no. No family money, no businesses, no training, no trade. Mm. The military's out, and I'm surviving on $60 a week. So that's the way that went. So what's going through your, your head at the time? What 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 are you what are you doing? Like what are you or are you planning? Or what what's what's Glenn thinking about doing? Well, I knew I had to get out of that town. Okay. I mean, there's no future in a small town. So you knew that? I knew, but I had no real way to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, this friend of mine that moved here to Fort Worth with his wife, and they'd been pressuring me for a, like a year okay. to come out here. But I didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I wasn't set up. I wasn't nothing. So uh, finally, things went bad at that dishwasher job. <laughs> <laughs> How so? Oh, I was. Uh, it's been far too many years ago, but the, the hotel manager called me in and accused me of something, whatever. Mm -hmm. It wasn't true, whatever it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it made me real mad. So I called him up on the phone. I said, hey, you know, can I still come out there? The, that cool? Oh, yeah, yeah, come on. And I came. Okay, okay. Very and it got me out of that town. Yes. And it, I, think it's a, I think it's true in any small town. Mm. If you don't have family businesses or you're not connected to the government or the military somewhere or another well you can work at the only walmart or you can work at the only mm -hmm. machine shop or you can there's there's just no opportunity in, in small towns if, unless you fit one of those categories yeah okay so you go to the big town get a job okay okay that's that's how that happened so <clears throat> One of the, I, I was just telling Logan um, that one of the things I always remember or always think about even, and, and it's from remembering from where it came from, which is from talking to you is, I want, I want to bring this up, is filling up the shoe box. Like every day it's like a shoe box, a box of shoe, right? And, and the goal is to fill it the most you can so that when you look back, you most of the most of those shoe boxes are filled right mm -hmm. and so where where that has impacted my life tremendously like to this day if for whatever reason i'm like fill the shoe box like like for the day like fill the shoe box like till today glenn you're the one that 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 told me this I don't know if you remember. I do. I remember that. And uh, how how did you learn that, or how did you, the how did that mindset start growing in 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 you? Um, well, time time it, to me, time cannot be replaced. So five minutes ago was gone. Mm. You will never get that back. And so when when a person is born, yeah. my mother told me this. This is something I learned. 
And it makes sense when you think about it. It's not, it's not rocket. The moment you're born, you are headed for death. Mm. So it's just getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And then whenever that death happens, people die at two hours old. And they die at 102 years. We don't know how much time we have. But we do know it's decreasing. Mm. And every minute that you, that's in the past, you'll never, ever get it back. So if you look at your life from the box perspective, you know, I look at a calendar, I see so many boxes. I want to fill those mm. with all that available time so that I look back and say, well, and if a big box has all the little boxes, the days, big box being, say, for example, a year, mm -hmm. man, I got a lot packed in that box. Mm. Or I can look at it and say, well, mostly empty, mm -hmm. but you don't get to reopen the box and you don't get, you don't get a second chance. It's gone. Mm -hmm. So that's how I look at the boxes. And I figured out, man, time is precious because it's gone. You think about the term time, uh, time spent or he spends his time because you are spending and it, it, why would you spend it on on hollow empty nothingness right mm -hmm. when you can do something useful and and good for yourself and other people that's filling the box yeah. you get those boxes filled up and then you get the big box with the year in it and then you go oh my gosh i had a year mm. look at that year look at all these things that i was able to accomplish with that time yeah but yeah. if you let it go by it's gone forever can you think of any any particular moments that have really have really put that perspective there? Any any experiences there? Well, um, you know what I mean. Like uh, where 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 it expands. Like for example, for me, <clears throat> was when my dad died. When my dad died. That's when I was, when I really saw, I guess, when I really saw and felt that time, we're, we're all here for only a certain amount of time and you never know when that's going to happen. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, because like for him, it was like sudden, it wasn't, Hey, it's coming. Right. So, so that to me kind of put it in perspective of how yeah, like say what you need to want to say now because then you may not get the chance. So to me, that that really put it in, and I felt it. it. I didn't just understand it, you know. I saw it. I felt it. There was, you know, and and so for me, because that's something very deep. Like the moment you said that, I'm like, like I felt it, right? So how how did? How did you learn it so deeply? Well, I think uh, when you bring up your parents' death, mother or father or whatever, that's a crushing blow, even if you're not really close. Unless you hate your parents, you love your parents, kind of. Mm. Right? And you realize all the wasted time, the, the chances that you had that you didn't use. Mm -hmm. So my natural father, he died when I was nine. And I have my memories and all that, but the things that I couldn't ask because I didn't have the maturity or the insight to know that, hey, I should have asked or should have talked about. Mm -hmm. whatever. And then like my mother, when she passed away, oh, it about killed me. Because once again, you go, well, I should have, mm -hmm. should have talked about. Mm -hmm. And it's that whole hindsight's twenty twenty. So you don't want to get into beating yourself up, but you want to look and say, well, going forward, maybe I need to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And I've been known to tell people, use go back to the boxes, but in this topic, mm -hmm. don't prepackage your regrets. Mm -hmm. And I, this friend of mine has somebody in his life that I tried to get that point across. If you are mean abusive or neglectful of uh, this person that you care about 
you're prepackaging a regret because if that person runs out tomorrow and dies, car accident or what you know, you will all of a sudden have a package mm. that you get to open that is full of guilt and grief, and you're not ever going to be able to close that package. You always have an open package of guilt and problems. So you're pre-packaging a terrible thing for yourself if you're not thinking about this time element, that you have the time to sit down with this person and say, you know what, I'm sorry, I didn't do you right, I didn't treat you right, I was mean, or whatever it is you mm -hmm. have to say, get it in, because there's no guarantee that you're going to be alive in and out. And if you prepackaged your regrets mm -hmm. because you're not being considerate of that person, or whatever your relationship is, you're going to have problems. So <clears throat> for for someone that maybe starts, that maybe maybe already like is starting to, to feel this package building up, I suppose, what would, and, but, but nothing is lost yet, right? What, what would be a first step, would you say? What would be a first thing to do? Or like how how to, you know what I mean? Like what would what would you what would you recommend? I have this theory. It's just my own mm -hmm. ignorant opinion, but I believe I'm a loner by nature. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't pal around. I have certain friends, but I don't. I, I enjoy my own company. Mm -hmm. To enjoy my own company. You know, you hear the term, he's comfortable in his own skin, mm. or the opposite, he's uncomfortable in his own skin. Mm. I'm comfortable in my own skin, meaning that I'm me, mm -hmm. and I accept me, but I also know me. Mm. So you go on this journey of, of, of self-discovery. Back in the hippie days, right, the 70s and the 80s, 60s, all that, you would hear the term, well, you know, I'm, I got to find myself. I got to find myself, right? Mm. It was kind of a crutch for a lot of people. But in, for some people, it's real. So if you, I spent a lot of time alone. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, hey, who are you? What are your weaknesses? What are your strengths? I've heard it said that people, they self-deceive. So they lie to themselves and then believe the lie. Mm. It's different if somebody tells you a lie and expects you to believe it. But lie to yourself and then believe that lie? You're not being honest with who you are. Mm. And how do you know who you are? Mm. This is where people who don't like to be alone, it's not the only reason, certainly, but there are some people who just don't like their own company. Why don't they like their own company? Because they then start to discover who they are. Mm. Maybe I'm not such a good person. Maybe I'm not such a nice person. Maybe, oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to go back to my friends. It's an interesting theory. I, I, I agree with your theory. And I actually think, and I've thought about this many times now, that the problem, a, a big problem, especially today, is that, I think a, a lot of us have gotten used to lying to ourselves because it's what makes us it's what makes ourselves feel in a sense better and in a way it, it it's in a way also it's to not look at reality reality because I feel like a lot of us nowadays don't want to see reality because they don't want to face it so what happens is they start lying to themselves or we start lying to ourselves and maybe at some point or another. And then the, that's the scary part though, because if you keep lying to yourself enough, I think, and then you start believing what you're telling yourself, then at, at what point is like, okay, you know, you're too far gone. Like now it's kind of hard to bring you back to reality. You've, you've, you don't want to see it, you know? So I think, um, I think you're, you're, you're spot on because I've thought about that. Hence a reason also kind of do the podcast because 
because I think it's it's time to kind of point out the fact that there are dragons in life in the room sometimes and it's important to attack them by the source so meaning um so i've talked about this a little bit before and it's kind of like a dragon has like seven heads right and so it's like the big problem it's the dragon itself the other heads are just consequences of coming from that source of trouble right so um, and what well, this is saying, okay, well, I'm going to attack, I'm going to put a bandaid on this, or I'm just going to do this. I'm going to put a bandaid here, but I'm not really going to look at the source of where this problem is really coming from. Then I, I think it, that's the thing, like the, the dragging is getting too big and we don't want to see it in its eyes. And it's the only way to make it go away. And so what we do is Maybe we're afraid of looking at this dragon, so we end up blind to ourselves. We do that enough, and now people are depressed, and people have anxiety, um, and people are not comfortable with themselves. So they're at home, right? And maybe they're just not comfortable. I don't know. That's just, I, I don't know anything. This is kind of like what I think, based on what I see, based on even myself, because I'm since I started kind of practicing self-development, it's like, it's an ongoing thing. Like it's never stopping. Right? right. So I don't know. What do you think? I think you're making very excellent points throughout that whole thing. I think that's about right. And when you get to the point where you're facing that dragon in the heads and all that, I can't improve on what you said. I think you covered it really well. Yeah. You, you, you also talk about yin and yang. Yeah. So tell me, uh, uh, tell, t tell me about what you know about yin and yang. Very little. But I understand the, the, the opposites and the compatibility factors. Okay. So it can be, you know, it's, it's I don't know if a good example. That's about the way I would put it. It's a compatibility of opposing forces, mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. and they can be made compatible. It can happen. Mm -hmm. And every person, well, I'll, let me think of it this way. The devil and an angel mm. on each shoulder. Mm -hmm. And ideally, I would tell you that you get rid of the devil. But you, you neither one's ever gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But you want to mute out this guy over here, this devil, and enhance you know, the angel. So without, you're never going to get an ideal anything right now. So you're going to have good and evil. Mm. And they and, and, and things can happen where if this person is evil but does something right, he can also be used as an example of evil turned to good. Mm. Tied into yin and yang. Mm. That's the best I can do. <laughs> so, I'm not a great studier of the Eastern philosophies, but I mean, I, I, I sort of understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the, what I know about it, it's what I've listened from, um, Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, I guess the way, the best way I can, I can, I can put it based on what, let's see if I can remember this properly, but it's, it's like, it's, it's kind of a representation that in the darkness there's it's easy to see the light which is you know you have the white dot right so in the darkness is easiest to see the star what shines the way what you should do so it's times of being I don't know, in the dark, these are really good, important times, and we really shouldn't shy away from them because it really is what points to the star. In the day, or let's say like in, in the other side, the white side of it with the with the black dot, it's like it's like everything can be good. It's daylight. You can see the way, but there's always something there that can that can show you the darkness. So ideally where you want to be, so you don't want to be 
in like say the light all the time because you don't want to want to be naive about the darkness and you don't want to be in the darkest too in the dark too long before you lose sight of of the star so really the best way or or the fine line to to walk through this is have one foot on each side so be aware of the good and also be aware of the dark mm -hmm. and having having a, a, the line having your feet walking that fine line it's the sweet spot because life is never going to be great and it's also never going to be dark right it's always going to be a balance and so that's that's my best that's a, that's a pretty good that's a pretty good example although mm. there are some who have it really great and there are some who don't mm. there is there are some people in this world that suffer beyond imagination and then we've got people on the other end of the spectrum who really have it good. You think so? Yeah. And it's all, it's all, I mean, part of, part of God's universe. I mean, it is, but I kind of use the scale thing, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't balance because you have far more people suffering mm -hmm. than you do have people who have it so good. And it's relative. So I've heard it said from people from other nations that Americans are rich, just the poorest Americans are richer than some of the wealthy people in some countries. And that's mm -hmm. been said. And, you know, um, no matter how poor in America a person is, the vast majority of people have a cell phone, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There are people that don't have food to eat in other places. Mm. But here's somebody with a cell phone, even though they're classified as poor in America. Mm. So it, it's relative, yes, but it's also the suffering of humanity and that we, especially Americans, we've had it so good for so long that and probably one of the reasons why Americans are considered so generous Right, because there, there there could be a lot of factors for that, but there are some seriously suffering people in the world. I think that suffering has always been here. Every like it's always it's all. I don't I don't think that's ever going to go away because it was here thousands of years ago. It's still here today, and I'm sure it, it'll be the same case in the future, I think, because I think suffering, I think suffering is, is a choice. Now there may be, um, there might be circumstances where people are not, I guess, born, you would say, right. And in, in similar circumstances, maybe like say like places in a different country, um, that are, that, like you mentioned, maybe the wealthiest there, it's the poorest one here, it's wealthier than them, right? So, but, but then at the end of the day, and the reason I say this is because someone said, okay, well, you know, suffering's always been there, whether people had to hunt for their food or they have to go around the street to pick up whatever it is they want to, or better yet, go and pay for, for a hot meal made already, right? So, um, so then what's the difference? Like what changes? And there's a book, um, okay. I probably can't remember the name right now, but it's, it talks about basically there's this man, um, in jail, basically he's put there and it's i think it's like the concentration camp i don't back in he's he's captured and so every day he's basically mad and suffering until he starts kind of writing down his thoughts and then he then realizes that the suffering is all just happening in his head and so 
I don't know, it's a great story, but that really puts it into perspective that a lot of times, and, and I say this because even, even it might be even true for me, even at times it's like, um, you know, it's like, why, why are we suffering? But maybe there's different types of sufferings, right? Because then how, what do you do with these people that are, don't have anything to eat, right? So, I mean, maybe there's different types of suffering because you can't really deny that. What do you think? Well, one thing I would say is that you mentioned the idea of suffering. Let me make sure I phrase this right. It's my belief that you can't always, you got to have opportunity. Mm. Okay. Yeah. If you don't yeah. have opportunity yeah. and you're suffering from something other than what you did, right? Mm. And you have no opportunity to get out of it. Mm. That suffering is, you, it becomes despair. So to give you an example, uh, American generosity and all that. We send all this food mm. to certain countries in this world. Mm -hmm. And certain tracking agencies know that certain local leaders, if you want to call them that, they're dictators and whatever, they grab those supplies. They don't get to the people. Mm. That's been known for a long time. So the generosity on our side, and we send this stuff to these these poor nation, poor people, mm -hmm. but local gangsters or whatever you want to call them, they grab it. Mm -hmm. Who knows what they do with it? They sell it on the black market or whatever they do. But after that step, all these suffering people, it's not by choice and it's not, and they don't have the opportunity to even fix it. So there are people who are suffering in spite of their best efforts mm -hmm. to, to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And what do we do? Well, we can stop sending the, the donations to keep them from getting into the warlord's hands or whoever they are. Probably the wise thing to do. But then we don't feel like we're doing our part. Mm -hmm. So as a nation, we did our part. We send the stuff over and we know the warlord's got it and all that. That's been going on forever. That's been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the thing to understand is if you have warlords, right, gangsters, whatever you want to call them, or you live in a dictatorship, mm. there's no choice. Right. Try to challenge the system. See where that gets you. And that's what these people know this. So I will stay in my hovel over here and suffer rather than go out there and face those guys and their armies and whatever they are. Mm-hmm. So there is there are exceptions to all of this stuff, and the the the, the whole idea of warlords like look, look what's going on in Mexico, it's not safe down there. Mm -mm. They don't dare go into that country. I don't care what part of it is, because these gangs are overtaking whole areas, and the Mexican government, they're doing their best, but they they're part of it. Yeah, and. So, Truly, and the corruption is so deep yeah. that it can't be fixed the way they're, whatever they're doing. I don't know what they're doing, but I know that I'm not crossing that border into that country. It's mm -hmm. just, it's, it's just prudent to, to stay here. Yeah. We have corruption in this country, deep, deep corruption. A lot more than the average American would even possibly think of. Mm -hmm. We have corruption. There's no question. I think the difference is that our people here, part of that corrupt machine, we've refined it. Mm -hmm. Down there, they have it. It's blatant. It's open. Mm -hmm. Everybody can see it. Here, no, not so much. But we're corrupt. I mean, as a nation. Right. right? But that leads to another thought. Mm. How can something possibly end? if it stays in perfect condition. Corruption is part of the eventuality. I cannot die unless some corruption is in my system. Mm. So corruption, in my view, is part of the natural order. 
Okay. The question is, or, or, the, or the dilemma is, control the corruption. You got to keep the corruption contained. If you can do now, the United States, eh, but we're not considered to be that great of a country in terms of corruption. We're kind of down on the list, like so many other things. The corruption in this country is there. We know it. Has it gotten out of control? Like in Mexico, mm. it's out of control. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, we're getting close, but we're not there. Mm -hmm. But corruption, and that's the I love the, the I love the word why when it comes to philosophy. I love that. So, the role of corruption in my death. My by, by corruption, I mean mental breakdown. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not mental, but I mean I mean uh, medical. Me okay. Medical breakdown. Something has to go wrong, and that corruption has to start somewhere mm. in order for my life to end the way it should. Otherwise, you just live on forever. Right. So, it's it's interesting. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'd never die. And that wasn't planned. God didn't plan it that way. So, mm. so does corruption exist as a natural force and we the only goal is if you accept that then you have to keep it within controllable points okay, okay. you get the flu yeah. you take the medicine you get sick you take the medicine you get better you do what you can mm -hmm. to eradicate limit control if somebody says you have a dread disease then the doctors say, you got to follow this regimen, boom, 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 because they're trying to get the corruption under control mm. and maybe eradicate it. So then you go into remission and so on. Mm. That's mm. the reality. Mm -hmm. So it's always going to be there. It's a matter of controlling it. I think that corruption is a natural It's a natural, yeah. Thing. Yeah. And yeah, we got to control it. Yeah. Whether you're talking about a person or a nation right. or a company, companies have corruption. We know that. It's when they the corruption gets out of control mm -hmm. that is when companies get excited and say, hey, this person, this person, this person, they're all fired because they were corrupt. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. But it's there. Yes. I, I never thought about corruption th that extent. It makes complete sense. Yeah. It explains things. It does. It 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 does. Like it, it's not like I, I I I wouldn't necessarily say like I understand, but it does explain things and it follows similar patterns in like nature, I suppose. Yes. Yes, yes absolutely. But corruption is all throughout nature and it has to happen mm -hmm. or your trees wouldn't die and regrow, right? It's like mm -hmm. the forest fires. Nature has a role for natural forest fires, and that's to, to do positive things for the forest. But the corruption has to happen in order for the good to happen. Mm. So, you know, but that also leads to another why, mm. right? Mm. The element of warfare, right? Uh, I, me personally, I think, I think warfare is a tragedy, but that's my view. Mm -hmm. But the question becomes, I'll take it to a very, very, very different level. Okay. Let's say that I'm sick, right? Mm -hmm. I got some terrible whatever, right? So my immunity system's going to kick in and to fight off whatever's making me sick mm. there's no choice on my part it's just part of me mm. the immune system kicks in and what does it do say for example the white blood cells they go to work they mm. go to war mm -hmm. and scientists have said it's there's no pity there's no mercy there's total self-sacrifice these white blood cells poof, mm. And they sacrifice themselves. No, I mean, on a sub-level. Right. They're not going to survive. They don't even try. They attack you, whatever mm -hmm. it is. And that's what, if it's successful, 
you survive. Mm-hmm. So you have this warfare in your body, right? Mm-hmm. Now, why did you have the problem to begin with? This ties into resources. Okay. Because warfare typically is taken back to uh, resources. Mm. Somebody wants resources. Mm-hmm. Which we're, the hunt for resources is a big part of warfare. So within your body, you get some kind of amoeba or whatever. Um, that, that whatever it is, is looking for resources within your body. And mm-hmm. your immune system is trying to protect your resources to include your health by eradicating the threat. Mm-hmm. So it's pitiless, it's merciless, self-sacrificing warfare on a obviously a microscopic level. Mm-hmm. But it's still warfare. So you translate it to the world. And you ask this question. Is warfare a natural event? Mm. Gosh. It's like um, you can't almost. It's just. It's inedible, right? Like you you just can't help it. It has to happen. Maybe. But is it natural? Hmm. That's I, I would say probably loops back to how humans are. So humans will naturally defend their whatever they're defending, whether it's themselves, their family, their city, their town, their country. But I think it's a natural cause. Or just, it, or, or it, I think it's maybe just a, uh, I think it's a consequence of nature. So is it natural? I would say no. I think it's a consequence. So if, if it's no, then what would your body, how would your body react to uh, these sicknesses, foreign invaders in your body? Mm. Because you have no control over your immune system. You can sabotage it. Or you can have things that will damage it. Well, I I think that's I think that's the thing. I don't think it's it's natural, but it's a consequence, right? So you, I guess it really shakes hand with natural because it almost has to happen. So if you get sick, yeah, is it anybody, right? Sick, your system is automatically supplied with your immunity or your immune system. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because, in my view, Mm -hmm. you're right, warfare can be considered a consequence. You're absolutely right. That's true. I agree with that. You're not, your immune system's not going to activate unless it has a reason to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so that's where your consequence that's where your consequence point is accurate i agree with that a thousand percent however if it you wouldn't be born with an immunity system if your body wasn't predisposed to understand that it Mm -hmm. will be under attack at some point in your life Mm -hmm. nobody lives never gotten sick Right. And, and what battled off the sickness was your pre-supplied immune system, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So if, so if, if, and because it's based on this, the um, desire for resources, right? Mm-hmm. I get a virus. Mm-hmm. What does that virus try to do? Take resources from me. Which Invade. Is, yeah. Grow. But take, take, take. Take. That's what kills you with cancer. Mm-hmm. Is taking your resources and eventually you're, you know, oh my God, what's going to happen to your body? Okay. So <clears throat> you make a valid point with that consequence. Mm-hmm. That's true. I agree with that. Mm-hmm. But I question, mm-hmm. I've never had the right answer for myself, but I've always wondered since it happens on, a, on such a microscopic level, is warfare natural? Yeah, the the natural part. I I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. 
I've been I've struggled with that question. One of my I think it's so hard because it's like it it's it's a good question. It's definitely a good question. It's kind of like the chicken or the egg. Which one came first? Well, not really because that it was came first. But it's it's still something that you don't. I don't know. That's a good. I don't know if it's natural. Here's my here's my here's my issue. That, that it, 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 the whole the whole war concept of warfare, right? Mm-hmm. And the incredible suffering people have gone through because of war is to me it's unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Now sometimes there's no choice. Right. If you want to have anything left, you got to stand up and defend. Right. But warfare in and of itself, to me. Mm-hmm. But now then. Let's let's take that same question and put it out in Mother Nature, right? Okay. This happens all the time, where this predator animal kills this animal mm-hmm. for food, right? Resources, mm-hmm. and then here comes another predator animal who takes it away from the first predator, and they fight to the death for that resource. Mm-hmm. Again, we have warfare over resources, mm-hmm. and that's in the natural world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I've heard it said, some people, they have political leanings, it's not the point, that if you if you eat um, food animals, um, some people have some really harsh views of that. Mm-hmm. And in my view, some people have called it an animal holocaust. Well, if you were the animal <laughs> that you're about to become on somebody's plate, if you knew it, would that would you have a war? If these animals could fight back against the human being, mm-hmm. would there be a warfare? Because once again, it's resources. Right now, a couple of weeks ago, I bought a carton of eggs for like eight bucks. For a carton of eggs. And people all over this country are screaming about certain politicians because this should never have happened. Mm. You know, you pay a buck ninety nine or something, like that, but eight bucks. So once again, we have the battle for resources. Mm. Mm-hmm. Isn't that that's to me that's always fascinated me resources it comes down to resources right that's the way i see it yeah and i think that you know um yeah mankind the whole planet it seems to me is forever short of resources they're always short of resources no matter where Mm -hmm. i mean uh yeah i can't really figure i can't really understand other than greed Mm. is power there are countries in this world that that never crawled out of poverty and you say well how in the world because we're well we're being americans we have a different view of it Mm. but we go back to lack of opportunity and dictators and so on but if i were to be born in just by geography Mm. and the grace of god here i sit but there's no reason i couldn't have been born somewhere else in some country that, you know, doesn't have running water. Right. Uh, basic, basic, basics. There are plenty of countries that really, and those people, it's not their fault that they were born there. Mm-hmm. They're suffering in those conditions. They're powerless to do anything about it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. As Americans, we have certain opportunities available that we take for granted, the whole entitlement thing. Mm-hmm. And these people in these other nations they just don't have that they're working 16 18 20 hours a day six days a week so they can have a bowl of rice and hey that's a rough that's you know in perspective that's right so it still comes back to resources yeah and then you have to ask yourself where are all the resources i mean it bothers me now and then you get the this little deliberate waste of natural national wealth which shouldn't happen that happens here we throw money away we throw money away like it's 
And yet people work very hard for their money. Hmm. And the government comes along and takes it away, and then they throw it away. Right? Yeah. That's resources lost. They're not coming back. Mm -hmm. Right? So mm -hmm. resources is a key factor. Resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No kidding. I'll never look at anything the same. Everything's a resource. It truly is. Yeah. I mean, if they could figure out a way to tax you for the air you breathe, They would. Yeah, right, right. They, they truly would. They already get you on the water. <laughs> mm hmm You know, you go to the gas station, you put whatever it costs nowadays for the water hose, and then they got the pump for the air tire. And, okay, maybe I can sort of understand that, but if they could figure out a way, they would do it. And remember, I forget which founding father it was. I have no idea too long ago but one of our founding fathers said the power to tax is the power to destroy so we go right back to resources if you you work 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 got the money and then the government says 80 percent of it's mine huh and then you get to observe while they throw it away and not to your benefit mm. so once again we circle back to resources resources I want to circle back to, to the health thing because, you know, we talked about how our body fights whoever invades it, right? Or whatever virus or, or sickness, you name it. So, so there are like viruses that like are physically attacking it. What about, what about nowadays that it's been proven that, that your state of mind, like depression and these these type of thoughts, like they create sickness in your body, like they they literally it like literally it's it makes you sick by 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 constantly having your body under stress or even like survival mode or whatever it is that's causing stress or you know it doesn't have to be survival as in. I need food. It could be who they're living with, the circumstances, or maybe the abuse. Whatever it doesn't matter, right? But just if if just whatever the the reason is, and say you're under stress, anxiety, it literally makes you sick. Would you say that's that's another phenomenon of a ta type of sickness attacking your body? I believe it can. I definitely believe it can. You can sink yourself sick. So then the question then becomes, where do these thoughts come from? And how is it that some people know how to organize them a certain way to get past them? And some drown. Like, where where do these thoughts come from? The thoughts about sickness. No, no, thoughts just thoughts. Sickness? Yeah, like the whatever, however, whatever it's even like currently coming in my head. What do you think? Where do these thoughts come from? I believe that this this is interesting to me. Everything is relative. So the poverty that I might have experienced as a young person would not even touch the scale of people in, again, some foreign countries mm -hmm. really, really, really have it bad. So it's relative. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where I'm poverty stricken, right? Mm -hmm. I look around, nice cars, big houses, people have a lot of money. They're out doing all kinds of things and taking all right, right? Here I am on my 200cc motorcycle with 30 bucks. If I'm not careful, I'm going to start feeling sorry for myself because look at all this wealth around me, mm. right? It's relative. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to declare myself to be poverty stricken because I only have a motorcycle of 200 cc. I only have $30. Mm -hmm. Tell that 
to somebody in some parts of this world who would have absolutely nothing to eat, live in a shack, lying on dirt, wear snakes and spiders, and oh yeah, oh yeah, we lost Uncle Fred because he got hit by a cobra. We don't have it. So we have to keep things and understand that everything's relative. Mm -hmm. Right? My poverty is relative to your wealth or vice versa. So you can think yourself sick. Mm -hmm. Believe that. It's all about an attitude, about how you look at life. Attitude. I'm not, I've been very wealthy, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. The only reason I was poverty stricken was because other everybody around me was more wealthy than I was. Mm -hmm. See, relative. So you put somebody on a plane and drop them off in a jungle somewhere. Uh, now you're not so wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's relative. It's relative. Yeah. And if you approach it from relativity, then you get a different, then you get like, hey, I don't have it so bad. I have it pretty good. Mm -hmm. I just, it goes back, to, I tied that into the entitlement thing. Since you're wealthy, why am I, why am I, why am I not wealthy? Mm. You see? Mm -hmm. I'm entitled too. Mm -hmm. Who said that? Other than certain government programs. Who said that? Mm-hmm. You can get your own balance if you realize it's all relative. That's the way I see it. Yeah. No, it's 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 relative. It really is. Yeah. No, it makes sense. It makes sense and and um it puts it into perspective, I think. Um and so, you know, I think sometimes even People would say like don't don't compare, and I think there's there's a, a fine line there with with comparison and and um and inspirations, right? Because you can be inspired to work towards something, or you can compare whatever it is that you can use that instead of inspiration, you can use it as comparison. So then it, it, it really comes back to um, perspective. Agreed. So, so if I can look at you, you as a person, mm -hmm. say she's inspiring, right? So how did, how did she one, two, three, ABC and all that? If, if she can do this, in spite of all the adversity, mm. maybe I can. Maybe. But if you turning it around, if you had a group of people aspiring for whatever and you had a 100% failure rate, would anybody even try? You wouldn't try because it's a 100% failure. Why would I do that? Right. So you do have the inspirational idea. You do have people who look at other people's success and say, whatever it is, mm -hmm. say, you know what? I can do that. I can, I can try for it because maybe I can succeed at it. But with that goes opportunity. Mm -hmm. If I'm stuck in a hut somewhere and the local militia is running around shooting people, well, I don't have any opportunity to fix this. Right? So it's the people, in my view... You have to respect and aspire, but understand the opportunity. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't like the idea of taking credit for all these things that I may or may not have done. I look at the idea of inspiration. People inspired me. I look at who taught me. Example: tie my shoes. My mother. Right. Mm -hmm. I could never have gotten into the alarm industry if I didn't know how to type. Well, I took typing one, typing two. So those teachers and the fact that, okay, I put in the, I put in the work. Mm. I learned how to do it. But the teachers taught me. And so that led me to my career in the alarm world. So you had to be able to, mm -hmm. at least when I got into it. And so that opened the door, right? Yeah. So it's opportunity. It's investment in yourself. It's aspiration. It's inspiration. You look at these things. 
time. You know, it's just amazing how that whole thing works. Yes. I think you just mentioned something keyword, which is investment in yourself. Because even if opportunity does come and you don't invest in yourself, that opportunity just went on to somebody else. That's right. Right. So I, I guess in a sense, it's like, um, like it, it goes maybe a little bit back to uh, maybe it's just to a numbers game. Right. So it's just a matter of putting the face sometimes in opportunities. So if you don't invest in yourself, that opportunity is just going to pass to someone else. True. So in a sense, it's multiple things together working together to make things happen. You know, it's not like one thing or another. It's a series of things happening. And when these things do happen, then what do people call it sometimes? A miracle. But is it a miracle? Well, what is a miracle? If, if you ask me, a miracle is something God-given that can't happen without some kind of intervention. Mm. That's my idea of a miracle. It's just, without intervention, it's not going to happen. Okay. To invest in yourself, in the like you were just talking about, I can elect to play video games all day long, which is what it is, or I can elect to read a book. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Because remember that libraries forever were considered repositories of knowledge. That's really what a library is. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting to me, investing in yourself, Mm -hmm. is take the Bible. The Bible's been around a couple thousand years. The people who, I want to get this right, took their knowledge, put it onto paper, of course it's been translated, you're actually accessing the thoughts and the viewpoints of people who have been dead for a thousand years. And it's transferring from them to you. It's been going on from day one. So if I want to be a doctor, I have to go to a library. Wikipedia ain't going to make it. Mm. Right? <laughs> so, so you have to go into a library and you have to do your work. Mm-hmm. But what's within those books is knowledge. And that knowledge came from somebody else's brain. And into that book. Mm -hmm. And now you benefit Mm -hmm. from the knowledge in the book. So if I read, you write some material and I read it, I'm actually accessing whatever you released out of your mind. It's so cool when I think about what is available to us, opportunities or investing in yourself. I used to be a bookworm. I read everything, no matter what it was. My mother, and she, I didn't know it at the time, but she'd buy me, she'd sign me up for books and magazines and stuff because she knew I was a bookworm. Mm. Didn't matter what it was, I read it. And uh, back in them days, you know, all I had in my room was a radio. So I had the radio, but I, I had, I built up a collection of books and stuff. I'd go in there and read books all day long. So that is an example of investing in yourself. And this is kind of a funny little story. I read so many books when I was a kid. And I get into, I think it was in junior high. And a teacher calls me up and says, well, uh, Glenn, come up to the board and di- diagram, you know, this material. I was honest. I said, I don't know how to do that. She looked at me. What do you mean you don't, you don't, what do you mean you don't know how to do that? Mm-hmm. She said, your work is almost perfect, your written material. Yeah. And you don't know how to diagram a sentence. Don't have a clue. So (laughs) flabbergasted. How can you write what you write to me, which is almost always an A, and not know how to diagram a sentence? I said, well, I can read it and know it's wrong. I can write it and know it's wrong. So I correct myself, make sure it's right. She said, you're a bookworm. Because, yeah, truly. Mm-hmm. And back in those days, the print, the publishers made sure, 
it's the kind of books I read were that way anyway, that you read, the, the, the grammar is correct. The periods in the right places, the commas, and all that. What bothers me today is I'm reading material today that's coming out from all over everywhere, and the grammar's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. Like, who wrote this? And we're talking products, you know, where it's coming from, from other countries that English is a second language and all that. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that that's teaching other people who read mm -hmm. that this is the right way to write it, and it's not. It's just absolutely not right. But I can spot it, you see? Yeah. So yeah. you invest in yourself. That, I would say, if you don't know where to start, probably education is probably a good start. And you just mentioned, like, people that have somehow learned all these things, however, and then they put them in this book, in these books, and in, in turn kind of start a collection of a library. But then you, but then it's also interesting because you have to be careful nowadays with so much information, what it is that you read. True. Right. So, okay, well, that's, that's interesting because we touched base on a library and books and um, that's been on my mind lately because I think that is, if anything, with, with some, with, with whatever is going on, especially what's going on today in, in life, like I see a lot of suffering, uh, you know, I'm a real estate agent, so I, I, some, I, I get to talk to a lot of people and um a lot of people are suffering they're suffering and so that's my question it's like so much so much suffering um where do you start you start i think reading because reading it's kind of saying hey i want to lose weight how do you start? You start working your muscles. You go to the gym to move your muscles around to get a move in. If you want to learn something else or figure out something or get, get a different way of thinking, how do you get a different way of thinking? The, the one you've developed along the way, you don't want it. So how do you get another one or a different thought? You have to almost kind of read and adopt somebody else's by reading, by working those muscles in your brain. So just like you want to lose weight, you go to the gym and move your muscles. I think similarly with, with, with your head and with thinking, and if you want to change it, if you don't like what's accumulated along the years, you got to work it. And so in a way, we know that 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 in order to to live the life you want to live, you kind of have to be in a certain health condition at least to do certain things, right? You have to be, you have to be, at least you want to want to get out of the house for one, you know, right? So, so then, similarly, with your brain, if you if you're feeling sick, you don't like the thoughts that are replaying in your brain, which 80 to 90% are the same thoughts every day. If you don't do something to start changing those, you're going to be the same person or you're going to keep repeating those. And it may just lead to a road that you're, you're blind to. Right. So then you, you hit it. And, and the reason I want to bring this up is because now I know more than anything that, that you're into books and reading. So I, I want to get this, I want to get what you think on, on that, that thought, because this is what I think I have no clue. I I'm just kind of speaking what I've gathered. What do you think? Uh, well, I, <clears throat> excuse me. You're right on spot with the, with the, the mus muscular exercise of your brain. Mm. And they, even with elderly people or people that are sick, you know, whatever, 
they push the idea of crossword puzzles, and dominoes, and games, card games, because it helps retain or increase the, the, the ability of your brain to work. Mm. So on a, on a different level, you want to push your mind hard. You really want to push it because we don't have any clue how powerful the mind is. We just know it is. Mm. We've mankind's never discovered how powerful the mind is. So you can do things that are just really incredible. But I was told this when I was younger and this applies right to this topic. Two ears, one, uh, two ears, one mouth. Use it in that proportion. Mm. So what that means is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, truly, yeah. I know what I know, but I don't know what you know. Mm -hmm. So it's more important for me to listen and listen, not just hear. Listen to what you're saying mm. because you're transmitting the knowledge that you have from yourself to me. Now, I can weed through it and figure out, well, this might be accurate, this might not be accurate, or, or I can follow up and check on things. Mm. But two ears and one mouth does apply. Mm -hmm. So when it, it's almost mystical to me, books, that you in your mind can formulate how to do A, B, C, one, two, three, right? Mm-hmm. You formulate the thoughts, then you put them on paper. I have no clue. But when I read your work, you're actually, you're, the knowledge in your mind is actually transferring to me. That's why all these old historical texts like the Bible or whatever, just good books, good material, those wisdoms transfer all the way today from people who've been dead a couple thousand years. Wow, that's crazy. And it's even, it, it, it goes a level beyond because the power of the spoken word is almost incalculable. There's no question about that. But transfer of knowledge. So if you view your mind and you're exercising it like you talked about with the muscular activity and so on, very, very important. It's critically important. All my life I read books. Now, last few years I haven't, but... I don't want to get off my point. So within your mind, picture your mind sort of like one of those balls that they use for the lottery. Spins around, 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 but only like one comes out. So I noticed that years back, a long time ago, not so much anymore, I would have a vague notion in my head, Right? Just a vague notion, but I couldn't even verbalize it because I didn't have the vocabulary. So I'd have this one, well, what do I do? There's something in my head, but I don't know how to explain it. Right? Mm -hmm. Over the years, as I've gotten to where I, I've enhanced my vocabulary, now you can take a vague notion, mm -hmm. verbalize it, and your partner goes, hey, I get that. Now you've done something. So I think that a lot of a lot of people, human beings, just that way. You have these things in your head. You don't have the vocabulary to get it out. And there it just runs around in your head. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And you're frustrated because you want to, but you don't have the, mm -hmm. the ability. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So I have studied books. I have studied the philosophies, mostly European, but the idea is what is in your head that would be of use to me and how do you transfer that knowledge? Mm. We know that libraries are critical, absolutely crucial. Your lawyers, your doctors, your engineers, all the professions, they all go through the libraries because they're repositories of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Not your cell phone. I right? look it up on Wikipedia. No, you go to a library and read the printed thoughts of the author. It's amazing. because He did the work and you get the pay. I mean, that's kind of the way it works. I read that and I say, hey, uh, wow, I just learned this. And it came out of that person's head. Now think about that. 
It's amazing. Yes. Yes. Because it, it, it makes me think of, again, I'll, I'll sign him again. It's Jordan Peterson, the, his 12 rules for life. I think if I remember correctly, it took him about 12 years to write that book. 12 to 15 years. Can you, can you correct me on that, Logan? How long? The 12, 12 rules? Well, I don't want to get it wrong, but I know, I guess the point I'm trying to make is it was many years, years of research, all that he gets to package it in a book. And all those years, I, I, it, it makes me think of that as you're speaking because yes. And then you mentioned the Bible. That's, that's not 12. That's like thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And so my question now is because I was not a natural book reader growing up. Um, as a matter of fact, I avoided the books as much as I could. <laughs> I wanted to read. All I wanted to do was just play sports. That's really all I wanted to do. Sure. Um, growing up. So, but now, now I see the the importance, and I see. I, I mean, I see. So, I mean, it's just I like I I I can't believe I I uh, in almost in a sense I wish somebody would have almost forced me to read. You know, um, growing up. So, wh why do you think it's something so important? There's so much n knowledge. In some sense, I think we naturally just seek to to learn without even knowing like just being unconscious right we just kind of seek n seek the thought of just learning something but yet i think it's still a problem that today that getting young people to read books is a challenge what do you think well uh, it, this goes back to it's not fun i'd rather play my video game Mm -hmm. My parents want to be my friends and mm -hmm. not my parents. Mm -hmm. The school teachers are frustrated because they don't have the support of the parents because the parents will tell you little Johnny can do no wrong. Mm -hmm. That's not the way it was when I grew up. Mm -hmm. So now, of course, when I grew up, we didn't have computers and we didn't have video games. Well, we had some video games, but the idea that life is one big long party it's not true. It's a lot of hard work. And we don't expose children to hard work. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. We just don't do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You stay in your room 23 hours a day and play your games. And No, that's... Mm -hmm. it, I get mm -hmm. irritated, mm -hmm. truly, when you're talking about getting... See, if I had children, they'd be reading. Now, there wouldn't be... I'll, no, you'll read. Mm -hmm. And I would enforce that. Mm -hmm. You want to play an hour on your electronics? You give me four hours of reading, and mm -hmm. I want it verified. Mm -hmm. Because eventually, that young mind will figure out, wow, that when they start to realize the priceless knowledge versus playing a game. So one of the things that really, really irritates me beyond description is when people talk about, well, I spoil my kids or, or my kids are spoiled or whatever. To me, that is almost child abuse. Mm -hmm. Almost. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Because what is another word for spoiled? Ruined. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the spoiled child gets into the real world. And for whatever reason, mom and dad or the grandparents can't, or whoever. Mm -hmm. He's got to, from that point, he's got to figure it out real fast. And he should have figured it out way back. So now he enters the world with this unrealistic, not existing type of, this is the way of the world. No, it's not. It's hard work. You got to stay between the lines. Mm -hmm. You will live your entire life under somebody else's rules. doesn't matter. You will live your entire life under somebody else's rules. 
And if you don't get that, we have places called prisons where you will still live your life by somebody else's rules. And that's <laughs> why I I get irritated with that. Because <laughs> you're not it's not funny to have a spoiled child. It's not there's nothing amusing or a ha ha. No. It irritates me because that's why these kids don't read anymore. Most of them can't read their own diploma. This right here, they can't read the clocks. Mm -hmm. Believe that or not, there are children who cannot, do not know how to read that. Right. And they look at that watch and they age you because they don't wear watches. You see, mm -hmm. in the depth of their wisdom, I had my nephew tell me this, in the depth of their wisdom, they rely on that electronic device. So know what the time is. Mm -hmm. So I said, wait a minute, Daniel. I said, what if he quits? What do you mean? It's electronic. Quit any time. Poof. Now what do you do? He had no answer for that. Because, you know, I'm just an old man with a watch. <laughs> you know, that's, that's kind of the way he looked at it. But it's true, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why if I were to be bringing up children, truly, they'd be reading. They don't have to necessarily do it but reading opens the door mm. to every other opportunity you have if you can't read you're pretty well out of business now you can go out here and grunt labor your way through life but if you read and open that door then then the opportunities for americans are pretty well endless and you better be reading and you better be reading a lot because we're going into the time of the world where workers aren't needed anymore AI is coming up and, and all the, the uh, what do you call it, robots, all that stuff taking over everything. Now what are you going to do? You better have six degrees. You better have, well, 14 trades under your belt because that time is coming, right? Mm -hmm. It is. So self-investment. You must. And I don't think it's a choice. I would be terrified if I was, you know, 20 years old or whatever in today's world. Mm -hmm. I don't see it. And I, I spent my whole life reading books. Yeah. So, I mean, that enabled me to do certain things. Uh, I have a grade school education, worked real hard, great alarm career, all that. You know, now I'm reaching the end of my working years, thank God. But I would not want to try it today. I mean, oh, my goodness. And, and these kids... There are, it's not everybody. Right. They've got kids out there that are brilliant and they study night and day and uh, and they're going places. They have, they're creating opportunities mm. because they have the opportunity and they're taking full advantage of it. Yeah. So, yeah. That's the way I see it. I'm a fan of reading if you didn't know that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I love it. I... I love it now more than ever. I think ever since I kind of um, started kind of not liking who I was, you know, then then you kind of start kind of digging somewhere and it goes to self-investment like it. And, and how do you do that? You go, you got, you got to read, you got to listen to, to people that, you have to look for it, I guess, at the end of the day, because the information is there, the knowledge is there, the resources, at least for us, you know, anyways, is are there. A a a card to the like a library card, right? It's free if, if you you know. That's true. In Texas, anyways. Um. So, regardless, I think that is. That is key, and it makes me think of even my daughter, right? So it makes me think because, well, now there's Audible. I do listen to Audible books, but even then, I don't have, say, I, I don't have the experience to go back into my toolbox and say, well, this is how I did it when I was young. Because like I said, I would like, I would touch books only if I absolutely must do it um, in school. So now that I have a daughter and now my mindset has changed from where, when I was in school. So what would be your advice say to me as a mother of a eight month old 
who does want to, and I wouldn't say enforce, but I want to instill. I want, I want, I want my daughter to, 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 to take advantage of resources, books, specifically speaking right now that we're talking about this conversation, books, what, what advice would you give me? I'd load her up with books. I mean, really fun books, you know, mm -hmm. age appropriate and all that. I would try to stay off the computer. They have the the programs and all that. Yeah, that's fine. Books, real books. Hard books. Hard. Yeah. And I would say, look at this, look at this person or look at this creature. Look at how the rabbit's chasing the dog, whatever. Mm -hmm. say, Let's think about that. Can you imagine? And then okay. get her interested in what's going on. Mm -hmm. And, Get her interested. And then she'll, at some point, she'll start picking them up by herself and asking you, well, where's the next book in this this uh, selection? There's another book coming or whatever. But really push on then just say, hey, look, my whole life changed because of reading, which you're not telling a lie. Right. Because if you couldn't read, you wouldn't be where you're at. It's just right. a fact. And so I would play it that way. Make it interesting. Yeah. I think that's... I think I th that makes sense, as you say it, because when I, thinking of me when I was young and, and, and like, I just did not want to read books, I just, like I said, I thought they were boring, but it, it's not like I tried them and it was boring. I just never tried. It was just an idea that I had, right? So had, had I had had I seen how interesting or had someone that knew better than me at the time showed me that or, or showed me how interesting they could be, maybe that's the key because with, with kids, right. They're just, they're, they're just a ball of energy and they can't wait to learn. They're going to learn regardless. They're going to learn something. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. You, you know, and so whatever it is, that they're going to learn, well, that's, that, that can either be a good thing or not. Right. But then if you teach, if, if you somehow make it interesting, like you said, that can be the game changer for sure. Um, I'm big, big, big into history, big, big, particularly the 20th century. I mean, my thing. Mm-hmm. And this relates to what we're talking about because so many people I know, oh my God, history. And then and then if I start talking history, which believe me, I can go on for hours. My friends just go, enough, no more history, whatever. Because we can't do it. It's boring. It's dull. Nobody cares about all that because it's not interesting. Mm. So I look at black and white pictures and I look at color photos, and I'm old enough to have black and white pictures of myself, which actually is kind of weird. But So you look at a picture of way back when, right? I started to write a book. I mean, I actually did. I made a portion of the way through it. But the way that, and I was looking on historical texts, right? Mm -hmm. What would grab a person's interest? Right, the, the history teachers I had just seemed to have the ability to make history come alive. You've heard that. Make it come alive. The way I do it, from my head, mm -hmm. I think to myself, when then was now. When then was now. And I can get it. I, I mean, I remember in my own life, well, it was 1972, but then I think when then was now. And I'm there. So I look at a historical story mm -hmm. or whatever, and I go, okay, it's you know, 1865 Montana, and then I picture when then was now, because it was now in 1865. Mm -hmm. It really was. Mm -hmm. And everything was, the sun shone, and the rain came down, and, you know, it's it gives you the ability to connect mm -hmm. with that did for me. Mm -hmm. Then was now. Because right now, at some point in time, we'll be in the past. And then you can reflect back to what, what then was now. Mm -hmm. I remember that day and that was now. You see? Mm -hmm. you make it. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it. And another thing that I like to believe in is um, fulfill or deplete. 
fulfill or deplete. Right. I had this neighbor um, years back who had some personal relationship problems with her boyfriend or whatever he was. And so she caught me one night. She was wanting to talk to me. I said, okay, we'll talk. And, this, that. and she starts telling me all these things. And uh, she said, well, what do I do? I said, I don't give advice on matters of the heart. But you can measure anybody, including yourself, by asking. And you got to be honest. Don't lie to yourself. Does this person in spite of being cantankerous or whatever you want to think, difficult, does this person fulfill you or deplete you? Mm. And if this person depletes you, you better start thinking about your options. If this person fulfills you, mm. even though they're difficult, you might want to hold on to them. Mm-hmm. So... She's like, oh, I don't know. So I ask myself, Glenn, what's fulfilling you? What's depleting you? And we'll get rid of the stuff that depletes me, mm. right? Because mm-hmm. I can put that rule back on myself. And I draw fulfillment from ABC123. So mm. we go back to self investment. We go back mm. to, see, it, it works that way. If you really start adopting these kind of methods, for yourself and for other people, it it really. I think that helps, kind of put it into perspective because sometimes, sometimes people may be in a in a situation that they they don't want to be in, but they don't know that yet, right? So then, asking the right questions, it's important to get where you want to be faster before maybe it's too late in some circumstances, right? So when you put it that way, it makes sense. Does he deplete you or does he fulfill you? And I that, mean, these are great questions. Truly. A friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, um, known him for 30-some years, him and I worked together at this one company back, back decades ago. And we had another individual who worked there who was kind of a know-it-all, but real uh, just just sour mm. you know? but anyway so when you talk to him right mm. he come across pleasant enough but you talk to him back and forth and when he would leave or you would leave you're just wrung out just exhausted like oh god and I, we, we could never pin it down and finally, we figured it out. We got to talking back and forth. You ever notice that this guy, he, he, he takes the oxygen out of the room. He just depletes you completely to where you're almost, almost mental exhaustion. Almost. We figured out what was going on. Mm. So we, we found a way to counteract it. But fulfillment or depletion in a person, it doesn't matter what part of the hierarchy you're in. Mm. Mother, father, child, cousin, wherever you are in the hierarchy, fulfill or deplete does apply. It does. And it's equally important that you fulfill or, you look at fulfill fulfillment or depletion with your own person. Mm. You know, it's real important for your mental health. Yeah. Your emotional health. And then once you do that, then you start to figure out, hey, I'm getting a balance in my life. Mm. And I can be alone with myself because I know who I am mm. and I can appreciate there's, there's a person, again, the same person. I go out of my way to spend time with him because he fulfills me mm. as a friend. Mm-hmm. There are other people I know uh, that... Hmm, We're in the care. depletion. <laughs> it's just, it, it truly, and it doesn't make them bad people. They might go on their, down the road and completely fulfill somebody else. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Right. Because we all got to be who we are. But for me and what fulfills or depletes. And then you turn that around, right? And you say, and again, you got to be honest. Am I fulfilling or am I depleting? Mm-hmm. Right. 
I think we should start there. And it does happen that way because if if you're in, it doesn't matter what the relationship is. I've noticed because you got to pay attention to people. Mm -hmm. She always gets into a sour mood after ten minutes, and then next thing you know, she's rushing me off or whatever. What am I doing? Am I fulfilling or depleting? Mm. So then you have to invest individually in that person. You got to find out who they are, what their interests are, what bothers them, what fulfills, what depletes. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a 360 thing with, yeah. every, with everybody in your life. Yeah. But it requires honesty. And you can't, wrong word, you shouldn't apply your own biases, your own prejudices, your own light, you know, addiction, whatever, to another person without being honest with yourself. Because mm. it's not fair to the other person. Mm -hmm. I think, yes, spot on. Spot on because we, because I think if we do, would you say that when we do apply these sort of judgments against like others or put them in these boxes, I, I'd say, or these categories or these files, in a sense, the moment you put a label on somebody else, you've essentially, in a way, kind of stopped the search of that person, of, of who they are. If you're like, well, this person is this way, and you just kind of put them in this box, maybe this person is whatever, and then you put them in the file, and you basically, for whatever reason, I don't know, a lot of times it could be maybe sometimes ego. Whatever the case is. Um, and you really don't get to know that person further. Or if you do, then you'll realize maybe these initial judgments or this way, that however you categorize this person, you were wrong. And it's because if we're too quick to do that, In a sense, we stop trying to figure out who that person is unless somehow it's forced upon like us getting to know them and maybe our idea will change. But if it doesn't, then you'll never get to know that person. And who are you to say you know who they are just based on whatever time frame, right? So I don't know. What do you say? Would you say something like, would you say sometimes ego gets in the way or why are we so quick sometimes to put these people in categories? I think many times people can be threatened by other people. And the easiest way to deal with it is to trivialize them. And you trivialize them by labeling them and putting them in a category. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. but, but the big thing in your mind is you trivialize them. And you're right. You don't have any clue, really. Right. Good person, helping person, caring person, whatever. You make a judgment, snap decision that this person is. So not only do you trivialize them, put them into a category, but you have the lost opportunity of finding out truly who this person is. Right. Now, sometimes, if it, depending, but now I realize the severity value, but you know. Mm hmm. You don't really want to label anybody uh, in that way because, like you say, it it obscures who they are in your mind. And many people are threatened by other people, and it's easier to tear down that other person than to build up yourself. Mm. Instead of worrying about building up yourself, you're worrying about tearing down this other one. Yeah. Yeah, so then that would look back to self-development mm -hmm. and so everything kind of just loops back around back to like I, I feel like there's certain pillars in life and or like just certain foundations and things come back to like self-development yeah yeah you're right but if you're of a certain mindset it'd be far easier for me to attack you to tear you down than it is for me to put the work in mm. to better myself. Mm -hmm. Lazy. Mm -hmm. 
in a nutshell. Yeah. And self, like you say, self development, self investment. Um, there's this life is full of hard work, and it's a lot harder than people realize. It takes a lot of effort and energy, just your traditional educational path, you know. And then, and then that's assuming that you're invested at all in what's going on in school. Most kids aren't; they don't care. It's a social hour, but they, but. Even with that being said, your, your typical 12 years, uh, 13 with kindergarten, then you get out and go, what's this? What does it say about diploma? Is that diploma on that work? <laughs> so much for 12, 13 years of education, right? Mm -hmm. But then other kids come out and they're going, yeah, I'm going to Harvard. Mm -hmm. And you know who invested. Mm. Hard work every day, 13 years of it, and now they're on the way to Harvard invested and this guy over here is probably on a prison pipeline just yes investment mm -hmm. and investing in what resources resources this is a resource yes and we all are gifted with one so uh when you know little children or babies and whatever they're empty-headed they have a brain mm -hmm. There's nothing in it. You have to learn. You have to learn how to open your eyes. You have to learn how to hear. Starting off with the very, very, very basics. So you have an empty mind. And what is you as a parent or as an example person? Uh, what are you putting in that mind? Mm -hmm. See? It goes to the boxes. Mm -hmm. And my friend Dan, he passed away in 2008. He was a brilliant man. Just absolutely brilliant. And he would teach me different things, right? Teach me how to think about certain ways. He said, Glenn, he said, every person is an example person. Every person. So when you think about that, then you think, okay, well, what kind of example person am I? Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. And what kind of example person all around? So, so when you take that to its natural conclusion, mm -hmm. right? What is it you do want to example for your children or others or not show them? Because, mm -hmm. because once again, we everybody's an example person. That's why when certain authority figures and whatever, they, they don't make the cut, everybody's all disappointed. Yeah, because you, I, I, when I worked in that alarm company in South Carolina, or North Carolina rather, at a management meeting, and there was, there were problems on the floor with the, we had three different shifts. So the HR manager comes in there and she's prattling on about all these different things. And then she said, the way that the supervisors are acting in front of the operators, mm. she brought that up. And she says, um, does anybody know what I mean? Or put word? I said, yeah, it's called model the behavior. And everybody in the room, and she goes, there you go, right there. We have supervisors, blah, 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 blah. And she, there were people at that table who really didn't get it. Hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, if you want people to show up on time, you got to be here. If you want people to perform their job correctly, you got to do yours correctly. If you want people to invest in their job, you got to invest in yours. If you want people to invest in this company, you as a member of management need to invest in them. Mm -hmm. Model behavior. Mm -hmm. So example persons, right? Like you're going to be an example person for your child. Model the behavior, mm. right? So. Yeah. Those are my thoughts. Yeah. No, spot on. It's spot on. I think it shines light on a lot of things. A lot of questions sometimes or, you know, uh, you wonder. And I guess it's kind of like, it's kind of like being in a map and trying to find like a way. And then here comes somebody like Glenn and it kind of shines some light on that road. And it's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Like, and like model B, and, and you know, it's sometimes it's like, sometimes things have to be pointed out um, you know, such as model behavior, you know, you guys were having this meeting, 
you would think that anybody would just say, hey, well, common sense, right? Common behavior. There you go. But sometimes you just have to point it out. And, you know, you mentioned it's funny. Some people, it's like they still didn't get it. <laughs> okay. For these kind of people, is it that you really don't get it or you just don't want to see it because you don't want to change it? That's a good point. And so it's maybe, it's kind of like these people that lie to themselves and just continue, and they're, they do it so, they're so good at it now that they, they're all, they believe it almost sometimes. And the question would be, do they believe it? You know, at that point, who knows? Nobody knows. But, um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Cause you'll have those people, you have the, you'll have the people that do, and you have the people that don't. You have, um, I don't know, I'm losing my thought. Oh, the idea that modeling the behavior ties into character, and some people have described character as being, some people have said, doing the right thing, mm. even if nobody's there to see it. Yeah. So I, I heard this mm. story, Bill Bennett, he used to be, Education Secretary, I believe he was, under Ronald Reagan. Anyway, he was talking about some postgraduate courses he'd been teaching, and he had ethics students in his courses. These guys have master's degrees and so on. He said they go into the cafeteria of the university, and one of the milk machines that were giving out the— that was just throwing milk out in the cartons, mm -hmm. and all these— Master degree level students are picking up the milk, and, and and Bill Bennett walked in there. So the story goes. So with all this milk, well, it's free, isn't it? He said, "Not to the person that you just took it from. Mm -hmm. Do you know that the person who stacks the milk in that machine over there is going to have to pay for all that milk you people just drank?" So he said, "You people." He he, he told the story. You probably need to go back to ethics one hundred and one because. And that shows you lack of character. Mm -hmm. So what I like to do, because I'm no better than anybody else, certainly. I come to, I know the roads I travel. I, I know, you know, the, here's the stop sign. I stop, I signal, there's nobody there. And I go on my way. And why? If you develop the habit of doing what you're supposed to be doing, You'll never go wrong. And so one day when there's a policeman sitting there, he's going to see you stop, signal, and go. But if you take the attitude, oh, well, well you're showing a lack of character. Mm -hmm. You should always be doing what you're supposed to be doing, whether somebody's watching you or not. And that becomes model of behavior. Mm -hmm. When I worked at Monotronics, you remember Greg Hurst? Mm -hmm. When I worked at Monotronics, actually, and... Uh, I was sweeping up or doing something, I was cleaning, but it, it wasn't just wiping off the counter. I mean, I was actually doing something with the broom and the mop, whatever. And Greg says, well, you know, one of these operators came over and says, how do I get to be a supervisor, right? And Greg said, I pointed him right at you. You see what he's doing over there? <laughs> That's not part of his job, but he's doing it anyway. Oh, wow. So Greg brought that. I see you told him that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So character will, will build your person. Mm -hmm. It will. It's just a matter of a discipline. You discipline yourself, you build your character, and your character, along with all these topics we discussed, gets you way down the highway of life, and we know you want that highway to get better and better and better as you travel along on your personal highway of life. It's just, things are just going to get better. Investing mm. in yourself, going back through all the things. Yes. You know. So I live my life by this stuff. And I always tell people, you know, look, I'm no better than anybody, nobody, but I'm just as good. Mm. And if you remember that, right, mm -hmm. then it gives you a balance. Like, so you're humble, you know, the, mm -hmm. the Bible says a wise man is, is humble. The Bible also says a wise man holds his tongue. Mm. So it, 
Hmm. It all kind of wraps up into that little plate of knowledge and all this stuff i learned by by reading Hmm. go figure goes back 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 to reading back to reading i'm i have a friend of mine who i went to high school with and she always said she would be a doctor and we're a bunch of kids what do we know i was your typical kid i knew all the answers and none of the questions (laughs) Just, just true. I mean, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so she was always prattling on about how she's going to be a doctor, and we were all there. She, years ago, got her PhD. She's actually a doctor, and uh, I saw her a few years ago. I went to her house, and we talked about the old days. And I said, "Well." You remember when we were in high school, you were saying you're going to be a doctor. And I said, here you are. So she's, she teaches college and she does say she's got her businesses and whatever, but she's a huge example. Mm. She did not have it good. She had it really rough. Mm. And she went on and became a, a real life doctor. So she had her everything in the right spots in the right places. She disciplined herself and she, did her character building and the whole thing. It's all true, every word of it. So you would say she invested in herself by looking in the library. Yes, she lived in libraries. She lived in libraries. And then when you figure she did mm. not only, I think, a master's thesis, but also the PhD thesis, mm. which is, you know, and, and there's so much research and time and effort and energy time and when she when i was there she showed me some papers right that her, some of her students had written she said glenn these people have master's degrees look at what they wrote and she put off in the margins all their mistakes i'm going <laughs> no that can't be <laughs> you know it's just no. yeah no she everything we talked about she put her she invested an enormous amount of energy and time, resources mm. into her education as a person, and uh, yeah, she's a she's a amazing, amazing, uh, which ties into the, everything we talked about. But now you get to examine yourself because I do this right. Mm. You have some people call some people mm-hmm. underachiever, average achiever, overachiever. Mm-hmm. Right Mm -hmm. now, I won't talk about these two topics other than general IQ, but when it comes to the overachiever, is that mean another way of placing that? Because I don't know that that's a real good word the way it's employed, but you ask, is an overachiever uh, a life student of excellence? Mm. You see, that's another way of phrasing it. Mm-hmm. Can you say that again? Life achiever of excellence versus life achiever of excellence. In your life, you've life achiever you've, of excellence. You you're conquering and or have conquered mm-hmm. all the mountains to achieve excellence. Mm-hmm. Some people would just say that's an overachiever. I wouldn't cheapen it that way. Mm. Achiever of excellence is another way of saying it. So, and it, it's with your own personal life. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with your neighbor or how much money you got or whatever it is. If if it's your interest and you wanted to do this and you did it and you conquered the challenge, mm. but then you've got other challenges because people like that usually have multiple successes. And that starts to show that level of excellence. That's my opinion. It makes sense in my brain. It it makes sense because uh, it's it's almost like like little pieces of a puzzle. And granted, we're only gonna capture so many pieces, which are very little pieces within our lifetime. And you know, um, I, I heard it said this way. Actually, it reminds me of the pieces because it's like a lot of the way I heard it said is a lot of people think they've they have the picture made when they've only gathered a few pieces of the puzzle 
and then they think they've they've discovered it all when it, the pieces there's so many pieces we'll never know right. in our lifetime but anyways it reminds me because what what you're saying basically it's like little pieces <laughs> uh, that it makes sense they they go in with 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 what we're saying with even the inf- the knowledge you're transferring from your brain over to mine it's clicking i guess is what i'm trying to say and when you talk about little pieces my mother um and other people i knew at that time looked at it this way when you start as you're living your life yeah you're picking up pieces piece here piece here piece and they don't fit Mm-hmm. They're just random pieces that mm-hmm. don't seem to fit together. Mm-hmm. So my mom says, well, uh, what, ev- what eventually happens to people if you live long enough is all of a sudden you kind of figure it out in a mm-hmm. big picture way. And then you're gone. Mm-hmm. Truly. So over the course of my lifetime, I picked a piece up here, a piece there, this and that, different topics, different subjects, whatever. And it was all random. And you have all these pieces in your mind. Mm-hmm. Lately, meaning the last several years, all these pieces are starting to fall into place, and I'm getting it. I'm understanding. I told my buddy Ron, I said, well, yeah, now he's in his 70s, but well, we talk about things, right? Like, yeah, I get it. I understand. But when you reach that point where you understand how things work, you got to be ready. Mm. You see? And that's where your random elements and your random pieces come into being. Because now I look, I look back on life now and stuff I didn't understand. Going back to I had all the answers, didn't know the questions. Truly, I'm getting it. Like, oh. And it's hard to explain, but things make perfect sense how things work. And, uh, yeah. Mm. So what happened to this book you started writing? Oh, yes. I, I, I was just trying to write a book. Mm-hmm. And it was a, a, a fictional story. i got to be somewhat careful what I say here. The political landscape mm. in the country. Okay. And But it was way back. It was, you know, we were headed in that direction. So what I did is I had a... a the, the 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 scenario was I have it's a police state and dictatorship. <laughs> the United States had uh, in my version had lost the World War II and these dictator type people took over and so America was bad and all that and then so I had a professor who remembered all of these things. And he had a class, but he had a special class of students, a small group that he was teaching about what America was and what it had been, and not this phony baloney version of what they were being taught in the schools. I even came up with an acronym, uh, Community uh, Officer Sensitivity, it was Kossioff, I remember that, because I wanted to make it sound like a Russian term, Mm. and it was Kossioff. Um, so anyway, sensitivity enfor- yeah, cause, you know, sensitivity enforcement officers. Sensitivity enforcement officers. You've offended me. Well, we're going to throw you in prison, you know, that good stuff. And I worked my way through to the point where they were actually, this group of people were actually on the run because the secret police, you know, we're going to come get you. Mm. And then I just dropped the project. Mm. But it was about this, this wizened professor okay teaching these young people don't believe this baloney that being rammed down your throat it wasn't you know and it was cool uh you know come on, i can't remember how i set that word up the crossy off community yeah community community sensitivity enforcement officer mm-hmm. off. good thoughts there yeah it was cool i had a good time writing that but i just never finished it were you uh, are do you keep a journal? No, I don't do anything like that anymore. You used to? Yeah, I used to a long time ago, but then I thought, oh, you know, it's just gathering dust. And... You think so? Why? Why do you think that? Well, I mean, you know, you got to. One of the things I've learned in this life is don't take on anything that you don't take care of. Mm. 
if you're not willing to take care of it or able to take care of it, don't have it. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, in my view, God provides us with whatever he's providing us with. He's not going to give me whatever I'm greedy for, let's say. Let's say I want to buy a new new whatever, Mm -hmm. but I abuse the old one. Why Mm -hmm. would he give me a new one? That that doesn't work, right? Right. So then you know your limits. If I'm not willing to take care of what I have, Mm. why should I even want to have more? Now I have more that I'm not taking care of. That's why people, if you look, and, and this is no judgment on anybody, because people observations. have observations. People have issues, but they go out and they don't mow their lawn, right? Mm-hmm. They don't paint the back shed. They just let things happen, and maybe it's because they got too much on their plate. I get it, but I, I for me personally, I don't want anything that I won't or can't take care of. Mm-hmm. That's it. That, yeah, that's the way I see it. Yeah, it makes sense. Again, <laughs> again, it makes sense. It makes sense because then, th- then, I mean, you overfill your plate, and then things get overwhelming, and then that's where, that's where maybe that would be the defining moment. Either you get it, you get straightened out, and take care of your responsibilities. Or you let the responsibilities drag you and take over. And, you know, when you see people not mowing their lawns, um, character. We I, talked about character. I'm a big animal lover. I mean, I love animals. I really do. And my, I was big. I had cats because I lived in apartments. I didn't have dogs because I have no place to, you know. So I had cats and they were all rescues. Right, Mm -hmm. and I had those animals. Well, when my at some a certain point in time, I lived with my mom. I rented from her and stayed with her until she passed away. And well, anyway, so when I made all these moves, I ended up keeping uh, three cats. Well, they're just like people; they have their likes and dislikes and all that. So I had one cat who was being bullied by two other cats. They were ganging up on her, and she, poor creature. She just. So my friend Dan said, "Well, you know, I might want to find her, even though I'd had her longer than one of the other cats. It just broke my heart to see her being terrified every day by these two cats. So I felt like, as much as I hated to do it, I had to get her another home, and I did." Found her another home. Uh, and then my Tomcat, uh, he, anyway, he passed away. I had to put him to sleep. And then, why am I telling you this? What were we talking about? I lost my thought. <laughs> Wait, I, uh. I was responding to something you said. Yes. Um. Oh, I know what it was about about not having more than you can take. Yes, out. that was it. So, when I had to get find her a home, it's because of that reason. Mm-hmm. I couldn't provide her with what was needed, right. and therefore I had to give her up in a responsible way. Found another home, and then I maintained my other two because I could, without the bullying now, because they right. didn't bully each other, they were fine, and and she. I hope to God was fine. And that was the way it was because it was out of my ability mm-hmm. to take care of her. Yes. So don't take on anything that you're not able or willing to take care of. That's my, that was, I don't know how I lost my thought, but that, that's the way it is. Yeah. No, that's, that makes sense. <laughs> I feel like I've said that so much now, uh, but it, it really does because even, even, that's a great question to ask sometimes when, when taking on a responsibility and there's lots of responsibilities. I mean, there could, it can be anything from a pet, from uh, the responsibility of owning a home. We mentioned mowing the yard and upkeep, 
um, whether it, it is uh, even the responsibility of buying maybe a vehicle. I mean, you got to make sure that that you're not overfilling your plate and that you are that you plan for it basically, right? Because you don't want to get on this payment and now your monthly income is less than, you know, the output. So, yeah, no, it makes sense. And that's a good question. So sometimes, you know, and that does happen a lot like, look, we most Americans nowadays are in debt, right? I mean, sure, healthcare is is a big portion of it, but then credit card debt. There's a lot of credit card debt, right? Look how how much this question would help. Like, can this like responsibility fit? Can I take care of this responsibility? Basically, yes, yes, that's that's exactly right. If you, if if it's kind of. Can I give it the time, like you said? Can I give it the time and attention it needs? I I think of forecasting. I really do. Mm. I think of forecasting. So, for example, if you have, like, this one person had a real difficult car. Uh, if I remember the story right, he, he had a real difficult car, and it was constant problem, mechanical problems, or whatever, especially fuel problems, leakages, and so on. So this guy had a fire extinguisher in his car, which was really cool, a really wise move, because one day the, the engine caught fire, mm. and he was able to get the hood open and squirt the fire out before it destroyed everything under the hood. He had forecast, right? Yes. Um, and yes. I love the five Ps, right? Prior planning prevents poor performance. I've never heard that before. It's a fact. Prior, Say that again. Prior planning prevents poor performance. Gosh. Now, there's another way of seeing the five Ps, right? Let's see if I remember this. Poor planning provokes poor performance. Oh. Yes. Makes so much sense. It, 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 these things can really alter your life if you plan prior planning uh you're forecasting right yes. that this is the way it's probably going to be so i'm forecasting that this is going to happen yes. and this is my right prior planning <clears throat> yes yes i love it yeah and i love the opposite part you know poor planning provokes poor response Yes. Poor planning, poor planning oh provokes poor performance. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I have one more question for you. And that is I want to know what your definition of happiness means. What does it what does it represent or what does it mean to you? If a person can manage to satisfy their own interests and desires, reasonable, of course, right? Uh, then that would be a, a form of happiness to me. I'm perfectly fine. I'm, 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 I'm like I said earlier, I'm a grade school kid who worked hard all his life. I'm not a materialist person. I'm certainly not wealthy, but I'm happy. Because I'm not grasping after things that would not make me happy. I can, I could, oh, to give you an example, it's entertainment, but I like certain TV shows from the old days, and I usually watch them on the phone, right? Mm. And uh, smoke my cigarettes while I'm doing it, and I'm good. I'm good. Wrap it up with a meal, go to bed. That's sort of the way I do things, and I enjoy my own company. That mm. makes me happy. And it makes me happy to watch these shows. Mm. I get unhappy with drama and trauma and all these issues, especially if there's nothing there. Mm. And, you know, I see it a lot in people where we don't have a problem, so we're going to make one. Mm. <laughs> That's the equal and opposite. That just drives me nuts. 
So I think uh, I think the happiness thing is is number one. It's not commercialized idea. Mm. It's individualized to the person. So what makes you happy may or may not make me happy. But so you have to reach in yourself and find out what it is that does make you happy. And that's the way I do it. I just, well, this is what I enjoy. This is what I'm going to do. I accept myself. Right? I'm yes. Not, I'm not trying to compete with anybody. Right. And I I have this view. Uh, one of my big goals in life, and it's been this way for years, is to become a better Glenn today than I was yesterday. And I try that. Like, how do I... It's going to be baby steps, but I want to improve who I am today versus what I was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And you work on it. And, you you know, a friend of mine used to laugh at me, but I'd say, well, I'm improving the inner man, which is part of the whole philosophy, right? I'm improving the inner... Because, you know, he would he would use language and things, and I'd say, no, can't you drop that? Because... Um, a friend of mine calls that the stuttering rule. Stuttering rule. You're stuttering pretty soon. I am. Mm. So here, here he is with his potty mouth, and I'm, I'm asking, please, don't, you know, I don't. I'm trying to remove myself mm. from speaking that way, improving the inner man. Yes. And he would just, oh, he laugh at it. <laughs> But the power of the spoken word, and right, mm. the man. The the power of the spoken word is such that if we know that if you use certain words to describe people, right, mm-hmm. it gets into your head and you can't get it out. Oh, no matter how hard you try, you can't get that word out. Mm-hmm. It's like an image. Mm. It plants. It plants an image in your head. You don't want to see the image. Nowadays, people say, what is that, TMI or whatever? Too much information? Yeah. Well, so I'm working on this idea that if I, the British have a way of dealing with this. Mm. Now, like you've heard the word, how the British use the word bloody? Body? No, bloody. Bloody? Oh, yeah, like. Oh, that's. Uh, bloody, yeah. Bloody. Mm-hmm. That, bloody. Mm-hmm. that word is actually, I can't remember the, the term, but that word is a replacement word for other more harsh words. Okay. The British are refined enough to use the word bloody. Yes. In, in place. And they have other words, but that's an example okay. of improving the inner man, right? So. Yes. It's a head trip. <laughs> yes. I mean, it makes, I didn't even know that. I, I mean, I knew that they used the word like, oh, bloody, hey, bloody, whatever, right? So. But I didn't know it, they used it. Uh, it was as a replacement for more harsh words. Okay, that's my definition. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Glenn, thank you. I can't thank you enough for being here. Um, I know your your time is precious. I mean, look, it's coming from one of the guys that has the most um, philosophical knowledge that I know that I know in in my circle. So I truly value you being here today and sharing your thoughts, what you know, your knowledge with me. I, I, I truly value it. And, um, I'm very grateful that, that you're here today and that you accepted my invitation. Well, I'm very grateful that you had me on and I very much appreciate the experience because that's everything in this life. Mm. The only thing you're taking out of here is your experience. And it gets imprinted in your soul. I very much enjoyed this. I mean, I really did. And it's very difficult, it seems to me, to find people who are not only willing, but capable mm. of carrying on conversations like we had. So I, I very much appreciate it.